be born. Now, inactive spermacy is just a refraction pocket with the imagination only in the middle here. Now, common sites of cholestatum origin, mostly it is in the posterior part of the epitimbanum, then comes the posterior part of the mesotimbanum, then comes the anterior epitimbanum. Now, when I search for the classifications, I could say a lot of classifications starting from the etiology, the pathology, the site of perforation, the extent of cholestatomatous disease, some difficult areas, so the sinus tympani or the supratubal recess, whether the inflammation is present or it is a non inflamed cholestatoma, the ossicular status, and the classification has changed after the video otoscopy or with the complications of after surgical findings also you can classify. But in general, it was classified as congenital and acquired, which we commonly call the primary as well as secondary, but a tertiary group also exists, where exactly we do not know from where the cholesterol has come. Is it recidivism? Is it residual? Or is it following some temporal bone trauma? We are not sure. Then you classify it under tertiary. But commonly it is congenital and acquired. Congenital arising from the epithelial embryonic remnants and acquired, you know, the primary from the with a, no history of previous otitis media or perforation, and secondary, where there is a history of otitis media or perforation. Now, congenital described by corners, you can very well say it's a pearly white mass behind an intact impanic brain. Mostly it is seen in the andro superior part, probably due to the uh, it's arising from the remnants of sacus anticus or even sacus medius. But some people say that it can be seen in the postal superior part also. And the uh, criteria for calling congenital cholesterol by described by Levenson, a white mass medial to the normal drum, normal past tensa and placida, without any history of otoria or perforations, no previous autological procedures. And recently, the Neuroautological Society described that even when there are bouts of otitis media, they are not grounds for excluding the congenital cholesterol Now, theories, lot of theories are there. That means there is no definite theory. Maybe it takes epithelial cell rest, Friedberg's implantation, Rudy's invagination, Amy's epithelial migration, Michael's epidermoid formation, and even a famous metaplasia theory. And the cholesteatoma, there are two staging systems, the Nelson staging system and the Portsic staging system. Depending on the extent of cholesteatoma, you have in Nelson system and four grades in Portsic staging system. Now, primary acquired cholesteatoma, again, there are a lot of theories starting from the embryonic crust to the migration, invagination, metaplasia, or invasion. And the basal cell hyperplasia, where you get the papillary ingrowth from the basement membrane near the past placida, it can grow into the middle ear and grow superiorly to form a cholesteatoma or invasion, where there is a small tear in the past placida, basal, basal layer, or there may be micro pores in the past placida where there can be invasion of epithelium into the tympanic cavity. But the accepted theory nowadays is invagination theory, where the negative pressure produces invagination of the past placida and a retraction pocket is formed and the epithelial cells accumulate and is an iris for the bacterial infection. And these retraction pockets, as it touches the malleus neck or with the Prusak space, it grows superiorly. And the past tensa also can retract and produce prostitoma. And this has been described as grading one to four, starting from normal position or grade two where it uh, touches the incus and grade three touching the promontory and grade four, again, it adherent to the promontory. This is a diagrammatic representation starting from the normal drum going to the uh, small retraction pocket, touches the incus 
then goes and touches the promontory and later it adheres to the promontory, the adhesiotitis media. As the TOS has described, the minimal, uh, again, forgulates the minimal retraction or the pass flaccida is in contact with the neck of manius and depending on the erosion of outer attic wall, the scutum, if it is limited, it is grade three and grade four is severe erosion. Now, secondary acquired cholesteatoma, again, can perforation from the infection or trauma can cause cholesteatoma and there will be a marginal perforation. What happens is in the raw area, there will be a contact guidance. So the epithelial cells migrate across the denuded surface. And when they meet another epithelium, they stop. This is the contact inhibition. Again, a lot of theories, the implantation, the metaplasia, or the migration, or the papillary ingrowth or invasion theories are there. And depending on the extent of cholesteatoma, if it is one primary site, it is uh, stage one, more, more than one site, it is stage two. And when there are extracranial complications, it is stage three. And when there are intracranial complications, it becomes stage four. Now, one classification is the STAM classification. STAM is, uh, yes, stands for the sinus tympani or the supratubal recess, the uh, difficult areas. T is for the tympanic cavity, A for attic, and M for mastoid. This is a STAM classification. But later on, they have included C and O. So it's called a STAM co classification, where the complications, whether it is extracranial or intracranial, will be C1 or C2. And the ossicles, depending on the erosion of ossicles, it is O1, O2, or O3. That is the stamp co classification. Again, depending on the extent, it can be stage one, stage two, or stage three, as the prostatoma expands and erodes the important structures. But the European Association of Auto Neurology and the Japanese Autologic Society. In 2017, they came to a consensus in the classification, the staging system, etc., and almost everybody approved this classification. And that classification is like this. The cholesterol you can classify into three, the congenital, the acquired, and the unclassifiable type. Congenital I have described, the acquired again, retraction pocket cholesterol and non-retraction pocket cholesterol. This non-retraction pocket cholesteatoma or, or the secondary acquired process, secondary to the perforation or following trauma or surgery. Whereas the retraction pocket cholesteatoma, there can be three, the past tensa, the past placida, or a combination of past tensa and past placida. And the unclassifiable or the post-surgery, either it may be a recidivism or a recurrent cholesteatoma. This is an accepted classification. Now, another classification is the Pollock classification, CH for the cholesterol extension. When there are for eustachian tube ventilation and pneumatization. And depending on the extent, again, it has classified into stage one, two, or three. And all these four groups, again, were subdivided into four each. This appears to be a very big slide, but it's very simple. You have extension of prostatoma, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3, and 4A and 4B, starting from middle ear up to the petrous apex. And ossicles, again, depending on the ossicular status, you have O1, O2, O3, A, B, 4A, and B, when the foot plate is only and fixed. And again, complications, L2 and L4, when there are extracranial complications or intracranial complications. And E1 and E2, depending on the pneumatization of the eustachian tube. So once you identify following surgery, which group you have to include, you can select on the computer and write or interpret what exactly is the pathology and what is the classification. So it may extend posteriorly, even up to the sigmoid sinus, or intracranially, and sometimes the ossicles may be eroded, and that you can include. 
or whether there are extra cranial or intra cranial complications. Finally, you can chart out and tell you which, which area is involved even after surgery. But the jacular classification remains the same, still alive. The anti cholesteatoma or the sinus cholesteatoma and tensa retraction cholesteatoma. In acquired cholesteatoma, one common factor is the keratinizing squamous epithelium it grows beyond its normal limits. And the spread of cholesteatoma in the pathogens is determined by the ligaments of the middle ear, the mucosal folds, and the ossicles, ossicular status. And from the posterior tympanum, it grows superiorly, lateral to the incus, and goes and expands. Whereas a mesotympanic cholesteatoma usually goes into the sinus tympani and grows superiorly medial to the ossicular chain. So in short, the existing theories, one is the vacuum theory, then the metaplasia theory, immigration theory, and the basal cell hyperplasia theory. But there is a new theory. Again, this was inspired by Jackler et al. The mucosal fraction theory, which is accepted, it has come in 2019. There are three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. The phase one is with the role of mucosal fraction, then the role of mucins and trapped mucosal elements, and the role of keratinocyte hyperproliferation. I will come in a bit detail to understand it. You have to understand the mucociliary system of middle ear. There are three functional compartments. The cilia in the epithelium, even though it is cuboidal, mostly in the anterior part, it is pseudostratified ciliated columnar. And as you go posterior, it is flattened epithelium, but all contain cilia. And the ciliary beat is important. The protective mucus layer, it moves, and an airway surface liquid layer. So this mucus blanket is directed towards the eustachian tube. Now there are four important pathways for this mucociliary system. One is passing along the hypotympanum, and second is along the anterior tympanic cavity. One tract is along the roof, and one tract is over the promontory. Now this, this is the medial surface of tympanic brain. We can see the ciliary beat is towards the periphery, as I have told you in the beginning. And the postal superiorly, the ciliary beat is postal superior. This is very important. And as the mucos, mucosa is transported by the cilia, it attaches to the ossicular chain, where again there is mucosa. All these ciliary beat is upwards, and there will be a coupling effect, what is called the coaptation of tympanic membrane to the mucosa of the ossicles. And this becomes adherent, or there will be an intimacy between the mucosa of the tympanic membrane and the mucous membrane or the incus. So this approximation can be either the mucus blanket alone, or sometimes what happens is the ciliary interdigitation or sometimes the epithelial cells again approximate. And as the cilia beat superiorly, there will be a propulsive effect of the ciliary beat. So as it grows superiorly, there will be entrapment of the mucus blanket. And the ciliary beat is upwards. And there will be migration of epithelium like this on the surface of the ossicles. And this contracts. As this goes up, there will be contraction of the bridging mucosa and there will be sequential adhesion. The mucous membrane on the medial surface of the tympanic brain adheres to the mucosa of the ossicles and it grows superiorly. So the mucosal traction theory is in short, the mucus blanket migration then the mucosal migration, and later it forms a sequential addition. <coughs> what happens is there will be a defective wound healing process, and there will be chronic inflammatory response around the matrix, that is the perimatrix or the granulation tissue. They produce cytokines. 
and this granulation tissue then induces in invasion of keratinocytes. This granulation contains proteases, acid phosphatase, bond resorption proteins, osteoplastic activating factors, and prostaglandins. These cytokines, especially the tumor necrosis factor alpha lysosomal enzyme, the acid phosphatase, the cathepsin B, the leucine amino peptidase lysosine, and they cause directly bone erosion or indirectly by the release of lysosomal enzyme. And non lysosomal enzymes again produce bone erosion and collagen destruction. And one must not forget the role of endotoxins by bacteria also in the resorption of bone. And the resorption of bone is th thought to be due to the pressure by keratin, as we were, we were studying, and the enzymatic activity always promoted by the infection and the inflammation. The cytokines such as interleukin 1 and 6 and the tumor necrosis factors, the protein mediators, and the genetic factors all produce resorption of bone. And in histology, the bacterial biofilms were demonstrated in the cholesteatoma, which are resistant to antimicrobials. Some of you may ask why the acquired prostatoma is more in the feet in back. The mass flaccida is a pliant elastic membrane, and it is the only part of the membrane to contain mast cells, which secrete pro inflammatory cytokines and proteinases. And in the diseased state, this mass flaccida, the medial surface, has got increased the ciliary activity. And ocelles nearby the incus prob probably as an opposing mucosal surface. So when both of them meet, they adhere together and by the contraction, they are pulled superiorly. Now here, briefly about the radiology. In the plain x-rays uh, nowadays not used, but previously we used to see this type of air cellular systems. We could identify the sick point sinus or the techman, and sometimes we could see the cavity, whether it is operated or not. Now, in short, the CT findings are the sharply marginal and expansive soft tissue lesion. The tympanic membrane may be retracted, blunting or erosion of the sputum, erosion of techman and the ossicular chain, and the air cellular system. There may be it may be scalloped in appearance. Now, this CVCT one beam was, uh, there was an excellent talk by Devi Ramalingam in the morning, and uh, he told at least only 25% or one fourth of the radiation. So, you can very safely do in uh, children, especially in congenital prostitutoma. And I'm very happy that Dr. Devi is having a CVCT and he uses himself and not sending patients outside. Congratulations and thank you. And CT scan. As you see, you can see there will be erosion in the epitimbanum. And as the cholesterol grows, this erosion can extend superiorly and may reach the middle cranial fossa. And one important problem with CT scan is the granulations, the polyps, the edematous mucosa, and cholesterol all may appear same. So you are not sure whether it is polyp, whether it is granulation tissue, or if it is mucosa, etc. In such cases, what is useful is a diffusion weighted MRI. Where you can even inject a contrast, wait for 30, 35 minutes. And if you do scanning, you can the granulation tissue, the fibrosis, the mucosa all take up the contrast, whereas the cholesterol does not take contrast. And this cholesterol will be dark on T1 images and bright on T2 images. And even erosion of the semicircular canals of the membranous labyrinth can very well be demonstrated by the MRI only. And this is a, a typical picture of cholesterol and here you can see there will be peripheral enhancement that the central area is dark in color. So the, today, we have non-echo planar diffusion weighted imaging techniques. They have less artifacts, and then very, very useful in identifying the residual cholesterol or 
recurrent cholesterol or you want to follow the patient uh, post surgery previously people used to say we will have a second look after one year or two years but uh, after this non echo planar diffusion weighted mri techniques there is no need for a second look you can do mr imaging and you can identify whether there is cholesterol or so so i thank you the organizers of kencon uh, 2021 for giving me this opportunity thank you very much thank you sir uh, dr revi over to you dr revi uh, sharif are we going to have questions now or are we going to have questions uh, at the end in the interactive session i think maybe better in the end at the interactive session all right okay So thank you, Dr. Nambudri. It was a very illuminating and exhaustive talk. I have a few questions on the MRI screening of uh, uh, second look uh, patients, but I think we will wait uh, for that towards the end of our session. So I think, as per the schedule, I give the next talk, and my talk is going to be on uh, intact canal wall, and. Uh, in contrast to yours mine is more of a a video presentation on the technique and then we can talk about it uh, in detail later if we have time so the question here is why intact canal or canal wall up technique the answer to that is that uh, whether we like to acknowledge it or not having a modified radical cavity not always but in a definite uh, proportion of patients does give us long term problems the healing uh, of a cavity is longer the average time it takes to heal would be about 2 to 3 months a uh, collection of debris uh, etc will necessitate a regular follow up and i believe that uh, in contrast to other techniques of middle ear surgery a modified radical mastectomy or a canal wall down is generally considered more technically difficult uh we live in an age of endoscopes we are able to look around corners for better visualization and therefore are we better equipped and better capable of removing cholestatoma with the help of endoscopes and thus obviating the need for a canal wall down so we are better quality surgeons and therefore we should be able to remove the disease better the last uh, not accepted that's why i put the question mark uh, do you get better hearing results with the intact canal wall technique so what i'm going to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is run you quickly through what i would do a routine canal wall up reconstruction so here is an initial finding of a typical patient a colostoma with the posterior superior uh, a csom with the posterior superior colostoma the past tensa is intact it looks intact it's retracted the the malleus is foreshortened you've got a little bit of granulation in the posterior superior quadrant and if you suck in that region you will find uh, flakes of colostoma so you see that's the finding of the patient typically my step to approach a patient like that would be to give uh, canal wall incisions and the canal wall incisions are a necessary first step of my operation that's the region of the annulus and i would give the incision about a centimeter or so behind that and that incision runs all the way from inferior to superior uh, i would emphasize the use of both my hands during this part of the surgery the incision is given you know the steps of this protein uh first step of any of these operations the incision is deepened and then you give a vertical cut at 6 o'clock position and then you help uh, elevate that skin flap with a flag knife that's done and then you continue the incision superiorly to the level of the attic or the 12 o'clock position the skin is thicker there and therefore you are careful with the incision 
the angle of cutting changes. You elevate the medial flap. And then you give a vertical cut at the 12 o'clock position. So I give the cut at 12 o'clock, trying to have as much of skin in the posterior flap, which we are raising. And that corner is elevated. So at the end of this particular step, we've separated the so-called corners flap. The whole skin is elevated. You know exactly where the incision has been given. And this kind of incision facilitates good exposure and easy further progress. Once this is done, the next step is the postural approach and exposure. That is the, this is a revision case actually, I just go back. We have approached postorally. That's the exposed squamous temporal bone. There's a little cavity in this particular case filled with the thickened mucoidal discharge. You elevate the whole thing and you remove that part. Here you go. You remove that unhealthy tissue completely. And then you see a previously done cortical mastoidectomy. You use a piece of gauze to help retract that skin. Retract it. That is the posterior canal wall. That's the previously done cortical mastoidectomy. You retract the gauze. And your flap, which you've raised earlier, comes with it. And then you apply a retractor. And you've got a good exposure. So as you see here, there is no colstotoma in the antrum, but there's a colstotoma in the middle ear. So at this point of time, we look again, what is the finding? That's what it looks like after the incision. See, the incisions are clear from six o'clock or seven o'clock all the way to 12 o'clock. You have a granulation, you have a retraction and the instrument goes right inside. But when you look in the mastoid, you don't see it. You can tilt it all you want. You can't see much more than that. <clears throat> but that finding is pretty clear. Now, here's where the endoscope plays a role. If you don't use the endoscope for surgery, that's fine. That's an individual choice. But with the microscope, that's all you can see. But with the endoscope, with the endoscope, look there you can see so much better. So the role of endoscopes, at least for diagnosis, looking around corners is now well established. And this kind of view makes a compelling argument for the same. Now, once you've done that, you want to clear the disease in the mastoid. You've got a previously done mastoidectomy and I extend that mastoidectomy to remove all the unhealthy tissue. I preserve the canal wall and you see some kind of uh, mucus, cholesterol crystals in those cells. I'm going towards the mastoid tip. The advantage in a patient like this, if you were doing a canal wall down, you've got to go after literally every cell. And if you're going to go after literally every cell, you end up with a large cavity with all its attendant problems of having to reconstruct that, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure the lecture with Dr. Vijendra and then Dr. Manyan talk about reconstruction techniques, but the obvious problem is here. You have a cellular mastoid, all the cells are involved. You've got to remove all the cells and that itself will increase the size of the cavity. So here you go after the cells, but not as radically as you need to do otherwise. And here I've gone all the way down to the mastoid tip region. I go after the cells to some extent, clear out the disease. I don't have to go after all these apparently reasonably normal looking cells. There is no colostotoma, so I don't have to go behind all of them. Now, the next step would be some more infiltration because that's the last chance you get to infiltrate. You see the incision again, it's a clean incision. 
and this kind of incision helps in further steps of the operation. So I infiltrate with a very thin needle at the lower margin. I also infiltrate at the upper margin. I give an incision and help elevate that flap down towards the annulus. A similar incision in the anterior wall to help go in front of the attic because the pathology is in the attic. I give an incision like that. You can see the incision. It doesn't need a further description. Again, always incision given with a 15 blade knife and then deepened and completed with your flag knife. The flap is elevated all the way down to the level of the annulus. Now you enter the middle ear. You like to enter the middle ear inferiorly because the angle between the posterior canal wall and the tympanic membrane is most acute in this level. I use a piece of cotton to help with the elevation. That is the level of the annulus. We are now entering the middle ear, although you can see the annulus clearly. Like I said, somewhere here would be the region to enter the middle ear. I enter the middle ear and you've got a clean middle ear cavity. The middle ear looks normal in this region. And slowly we work our way towards the posterior superior area where the colostrum actually is. Now, the actual disease clearance. When I say AP tympanotomy, what I mean is I'm talking about exposure from the mastoid side. You see the mastoid, you see it's unhealthy, but we don't see colostoma here yet. It's more mucosa. You've got the posterior canal wall, you've got the tegment plate, you've got the space between the posterior canal wall and the tegment plate. That is the bone that you want to remove to get further exposure toward the aditus and the attic from the mastoid side. So I'm gonna forward the video a little quicker. The space may vary with patient to patient. If it's a forward lying sigmoid sinus or low lying dura, the space that you have here would be a lot more restricted. So I'm using a smaller burr right now. You've got to remove bone all from lateral all the way down to medial. Now you're getting close. You see the lateral canal in the depth and you see mucosa and a little forward, you will see the, the colostoma sac. That is the sac, a little tear on the sac. That's the anterior edge of the lateral canal. And you can actually begin to mobilize the colostoma to some extent from this approach itself. So the advantage of approaching the colostoma from the mastoid side and removing so much bone in this fashion means that the amount of drilling that you have to do intra, inside out is limited. So I try to mobilize the colostoma. Sometimes it tears. It doesn't matter if it tears. What's important is that you have to remove the entire sac in its entirety. You can't afford to leave behind disease. So I've mobilized the colostoma to a great extent from there. And once I've done that, once I've done that, I can come from inside out. When I say atichotomy, I mean coming from inside out. You see this picture before, the flaps have been elevated. Yeah, so now we've got this bone to remove. This is where the posterior superior retraction into the interim has commenced. So this posterior canal wall can be removed as required for that situation. Uh, uh, using a cutting burr is probably not the best idea at this particular stage, but um, a cutting burr is so much faster. 
So I would take that chance, but uh, I wouldn't probably recommend it to everybody. So you see how much of bone you remove would depend on the amount of erosion, the size of the colistoma, the extent of spread, et cetera, et cetera. I purposefully chose a very small case because the idea was to demonstrate the technique and more than that, to demonstrate the idea to you. I remove that bone, let me forward that a little more. And once that bone is removed, you remove bone from here to here. And then I'm working very hard to elevate that colistoma from there. That's the sac coming out. That's a remnant of the ossicle. That is the sac, the incus is out here. That's the sac. The ossicle is being removed as well. The incus is here, the malleus remains there, the incus is out here, and the entire sac comes out. And if you want to expose further, you expose further down towards the sinus tympani to have good exposure and to help aid in the complete removal of the colchitoma. I'm going to forward that, you get the idea. This is a little time consuming. And uh, the 12 minutes or so that I have is not sufficient for me to go through this part in detail. But suffice to say that, look, an adherence to the ossicles in this region and <clears throat> the entire disease without leaving any disease behind. So once this is done, see that little bit is remaining attached to the the remnant of the stapes or something like that. We should be careful not to dislocate or subluxate the stapes or the footplate. Be careful there. And now the whole thing comes out. There, that's the footplate remaining. There is no stapes left out there. That's mucosal fold and the entire sac comes out. So once it comes out, you remove the unhealthy portion and you get the idea. So now if I put the flap back, you have a perforation there and that is mostly like a central perforation. So now what's the question? Have you left behind disease? And that I would say, look around the corners with the endoscope. You are competent enough to make sure nothing is there. Look, I'm looking at the same thing with the endoscope. That's a remnant tympanic membrane, the round window, the promontory, the foot plate, the facial nerve, the lateral canal, the aditus, and the antrum. The tensor tympani muscle, the malleus is underneath there. So you get a panoramic view with the endoscope and the endoscope view will help with your conviction that you've removed all the disease. So use the endoscope to look around the corners. There in the region of the fossa incubus, you've got some granulation tissue. If you have any doubt, you can have the endoscope and cure it along with the use of the endoscope and make sure that all your doubts are taken care of. That's a view through the back, through the aditus into the middle ear. So, so once you've done that, the reconstruction is very easy. We don't have to worry about the cavity, so the reconstruction is a lot easier. So I use periosteum. The advantage of periosteum, I take periosteum, when I say periosteum, I take the attachment of the sternomastoid muscle, the deepest part of the soft tissue there. This is not strictly speaking periosteum, but it does the job admirably. So I could take that tissue, and I could press it and dry it like I do a graft, and that works wonderfully well. So just a little bit, we don't need much for a small defect. We could use periosteum, get away only with this soft tissue, just that soft tissue. I could press it down, see that? The advantage of this over cartilage is that it tends to mold itself to any defect. I wouldn't tend to use it on its own, but I use it with cartilage. If I use cartilage, I would use conchal cartilage 
not just conical cartilage, cartilage from the Simba concha. The Simba concha cartilage is uh, from there. I remove the soft tissue. The advantage of the Simba concha is that the tissue is the cartilage is, is thin, it's naturally curved and will fit the defect of the attic. So you can take as much of it as you want. You can take the whole thing with no real problem to the shape of the pinna. And you see that the cartilage is curved and will fit for a majority of our uses. Here I use a strip. I can take a strip. I can take a piece, a crescent, whatever we want, we can take. You see that the shape of the cartilage is, is, is curved. And that curvature helps us in the reconstruction. I can take more as I am doing at this particular point of time. So you can use the cartilage to support the tympanic membrane. If you're afraid of a retraction happening again, you can use a cartilage like this. You can use the cartilage even more finely and more neatly sliced. It tends to arch over the middle ear and therefore preserve the space of the middle ear. At the same time, it protects the tympanic membrane from further retraction. And then the last part of it is using a bit of cartilage. This is, the, this is one aspect. And then for the car attic, it's only a small defect. It could be a larger defect. And look at that, that's the defect that we have. We use a piece of cartilage to put it there and that's the reconstruction. So once you have a cartilage like that, all that you have is a settle perforation. And then the rest of the steps is like a myringoplasty and the healing is like a myringoplasty. Now I could go on with details of the reconstruction, but I believe I've given you an overview as to what I would mean by an intact canal wall reconstruction. The defect could be larger, the quercetoma could be larger, the findings could be different. At the same time, the basic technique and the reconstruction remains the same. So we won't talk about the sample res results. This is what it looks like post-operatively. You have uh, a piece of cartilage there, everything is healed beautifully over it. The canal wall is intact, there is no cavity. This kind of reconstruction in most cases tends to stay stable over the long term with no real desquamation, no debris, uh, no retraction, no recurrence, no discharge. So to conclude, I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm not saying uh, one size fits all. This is the only way to do it. Uh, intact canal wall is a good alternative. It's not the only one. It's got a lot of advantages. A little more tricky than to do uh, for a beginner. And as always, practice, practice, practice would make perfect. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ravi, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, Sharaf. Uh, I think we're not having questions now. We'll have a question later. Uh, could you invite Dr. Vijendra to give his speech on canal wall down? Dr. Vijendra? Over to Vijendra, sir. Your audio is not there, sir. Please unmute. Good afternoon, respected chairpersons, respected Professor Jack Mannion, sir. Moderator, Dr. Ravi and Namudri, sir. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure and honor to participate in this meeting. So this canal wall down procedure is my favorite thing, which I have been doing regularly. So as uh, Ravi's presentation was excellent presentation on intact canal wall procedure. So <clears throat> according to me, the indications are whenever there is a limited cholestoma, as Ravi showed, intact cholestoma sac, I prefer to do intact canal wall procedure. And otherwise, if the attic is destructed and ossicles are not there, if there's a big, big attic defect and it is an invasive type of cholestetoma, I prefer to do straight away canal wall down procedure. In my routine practice of late, I'm seeing more and more and more of uh, revision cases. So in my routine practice today, every day we do two cholestetoma cases in that one will be a revision case. So more than 50% of the cases what I'm doing now today is revision cases. 
the causes of revision cases are many, but it's very difficult. It is a, even if you do a good reconstruction, my own cases, which I have done in 96, 200, after some few years, some of that reconstruction part will give way and then they will have a retraction pocket and cholestatoma. It is not a residual or recurrent cholestatoma. It is because of the a retraction pocket. Sometimes it happens. So now <clears throat> I prefer to do more of a canal wall down procedure. If it is a rev revision cases, straight away I try to do canal wall down procedure. And if it is a invasive type of cholesterol without an intact sac, also I prefer to do canal wall down procedure. So there are certain principles one has to follow when you do canal wall down procedure. So I'll show how I do canal wall procedure. The most important thing is most of the people, they think that when you do canal wall down procedure, the most important thing is the cavity problem. But with my vast experience today, at least in 95 to 96%, if you see, there will be no cavity and it looks like intact canal. That is the perfection I have achieved with uh, my 30 years of experience. So whenever you're planning for canal wall down technique, the first incision will be close to the annulus so that I get more posterior soft post metal skin flap, which will be useful to line the cavity at the end of the procedure. So whenever I'm planning for a canal wall down procedure, this incision, horizontal incision varies from tympanoplasty. I go very close to the annulus so that this posterior metal skin flap will be very large and that will be useful to line the cavity. So in the beginning, I plan my surgery. So as Ravi showed the similar way, we make incision at horizontal incision. And then next thing is posteriorly, we go very close to the sulcus. The idea why I go close to the sulcus is I want to get more posteriorly soft tissue for obliteration of the cavity. I got a technique, a standard technique, which I learned from my beloved teacher, Dr. Mahadevi Asar. This I have been doing from so many years. So one more thing is I just want, when you are taking this postocular soft tissue, most important thing is we go very close to the conchal cartilage. And then if we go close, close to the conchal cartilage, you get a big junk of postocular soft tissue. From the beginning, you, I plan so that I take a big postocular soft tissue will be there. That will be useful for obliteration of the cavity. With a natural obliteration of the soft tissue, we will not have any cavity problem. That's the reason I make incision sulcus and then go closer to it. Then always when I do canal wall down procedure, I prefer to take a very large temporary fascia graft because at the end of the procedure, you will know how I am going to obliterate the cavity. There's a reason invariably I take a very big temporary fascia graft, which can nicely line the whole cavity and also helps in good healing. This is how I take a very big temporary fascia graft. The next thing is we go close to the post auricular area and then also one more horizontal incision. The most important thing is this post auricular soft tissue, see how I'm going to release it. When I'm doing canal order procedure, I just release this from the skin. This is very, very important so that I get a very big vascular bulk of post auricular soft tissue, which I can manipulate and obliterate the cavity depending upon the size of the cavity. That is how from the beginning only I plan for this. And why I do this in the beginning only means because the adrenal effect will be good and bleeding will be less. If you try to do this at the end, invariably it start bleeding. See like this, I can manipulate this flap. I can split the flap into two and lengthen the flap depending upon the size of the cavity. This is the most important thing to obliterate the cavity. This is a natural obliteration and it will remain forever like that. So whenever you're planning for a canal wall down procedure, before planning for the canal wall, always I do mastectomy and see the extension of the cholestatoma. If it is a limited cholestatoma with the intact sac, then I do the procedure what Ravi showed. If suppose if the invasive type and with a big attic defect with the malice head and incus is absent, then I do canal wall down procedure. That's why first I do a, a cortical mastectomy see the extension of the cholesterol. See, now it is an invasive type of cholesterol. There is no sac. So the moment I see this, immediately I decide to do canal wall down procedure. On the table, I take decision whether to go for canal wall down procedure or canal wall up procedure. So this is an invasive type of cholesterol. So then I take the superior and the tympanometer flaps, superior and inferior, before remo removing the, reducing the bridge, 
we create temperometer flares. And all, one more thing is, in this situation, first thing, I see the ossicular chain. Suppose if the ossicular chain is intact, in this case, you can see that incredible joint is intact. Before removing the bridge, one has to see the ossicular chain. In case if incredible uh, uh, joint is intact, first disarticulate the incredible joint, remove the incus, and then only try to remove the bridge. Without seeing that, don't do that. Suppose if you don't see this and try to remove the bridge, then there may be damage to the stapes and subluxation. That is the reason in all cases, however experience you have, each case will be different. See, this is a, even though extensive cholesterol was there, the ossicular chain was intact here. So the first thing is, before removing the bridge, you have to disarticulate the incredible joint and remove the incus, and then only you have to remove the bridge. Now I remove the, this thing. Now I'll take a very wide conical butt tape and do a, remove the posterior canal wall and saucerization. Certain principles always I follow. The principles to get a good cavity free problem is saucerization is the first thing. See the edges should be everted like this. The first thing is edges should be everted. Then you have to remove the bridge, reduce the reach, remove the anterior buttress, remove the posterior buttress, and open up the sinusoidal angle. These are the six principles always you have to follow and polish the cavity with a diamond butt tip like this. So your cavity should be polished and the tegment plate should be smooth and uniform like this. You have to make very smooth and uniform. Don't give it. Then I elevate this tympanometrial flap, going to the antiatic space. Then you have to remove the anterior buttress. This is anterior buttress. Anterior buttress is nothing but where the post eponymetal wall meets the tegment plate. Once if you remove the anterior buttress, the tegment antre and tegment tip and should be in a single leg. And always what I do, after elevating the superior flap, I create one platform of bone here. See how, I'll show you how I create the platform. There is a station to barifice. And in most of the cases, if the malleus is there, I amputate the head of the malleus and then I cut the tensor tendon and retain the handle of the malleus with the flap. That gives a wonderful post-operative picture. I'm going to show many pictures where if you retain the handle of the malleus, there are a lot of advantages there post-operatively. So in all cases, whenever possible, I retain the handle of the malleus. To retain the handle of the malleus, after dissecting the head of the, the sac from the head of the malleus, I just amputate. See, I'm amputating the at the neck of the malleus, I amputate. And then remove the head of the malleus. Then I cut the tensor tendon. And once I've cut the tensor tendon, the handle of the malleus will go with the flap. So like this, I retain the handle of the malleus. post operatively I'm going to show many cases where you can see. Now, that is the station to barify. In cholesterol trauma cases, always better plug the station to barify with the gel foam. Now I'm going to create a platform of bone anterior attic space. The reason is when I place my graft, it will sit over this platform of bone and it will give a good mid layer space. That is the reason I create a nice platform of bone and also I create a neo sulcus here so that my graft will nicely tuck there and it will not fall down in the mid layer cavity. This platform of bone will give a good aeration and also good mid layer space. In all cases, I create this platform of bone and then my graft will sit over that and underneath that I'm going to obliterate the soft tissue. The next thing is lowering the bridge. We see so much of uh, revision cases. In almost all revision cases which I see is the previous surgeon would have not reduced the facial ridge. The high facial ridge is one of the problem, a cavity problem. And uh, because of this patient, uh, because the facial now, so most of the surgeons, they, they don't reduce the ridge. If you don't reduce the ridge, you'll have cavity problem forever. So the, this is one of the most important thing. One has to reduce the ridge up to the dome of the lateral semicircle canal. Nothing will happen if you know the anatomy. That's why you have to do dissection, dissection, dissection. So now see the dome of the lateral semicircle canal there, up to that level or even a little below that level, you have to reduce the ridge. If you reduce the ridge, then only you will not have cavity problems. Very, very important step I'm telling. And now you see, look at this, how I am reducing almost to the level of the dome of the lateral semiscanal. Now, if you see my cavity, the massad cavity, the ridge and the massad cavity in the same line, there's no pocket here. Suppose if there's a hump of ridge, 
then that will cause a pocket here and that will cause cavity problem. The main common cause for cavity problem is the non-reduction of the facial rings. See, look at this, how I have reduced. Up, even up see, till you see the facial shadow, you can remove or reduce the ridge. Take a diamond by tip and get. The next important thing is another important thing is removal of the posterior buttress. You have to completely remove the posterior buttress, the floor of the external canal, the mastoid tip should be in a single leg. That is another very important step we have to take care. So once if you remove this posterior buttress and see that the uh, uh, floor of the external canal, mastoid tip should be in a single leg. Now, if you achieve this, these principles, that is the saucerization, removing the bridge, lowering the ridge, posterior buttress, anterior buttress removal, then definitely you will not have any cavity problem. The main problem for cavity problem is unremoval of the posterior buttress and high facial ridge is a very, very common thing which causes the cavity problem. Like this, I have almost all cases, I do the same thing. I'm very, very happy with my results. There's no chance of any recurrence and there's no, there'll be no cavity problem. Now, then as usual, we see the ossicular chain and depending upon the ossicular pathology, I prefer to do. Now, the lastly, always I polish the whole mastoid cavity, the diamond butty. My mastoid cavity should look like a mosaic, uh, the Italian marble floor. So here the stapes was there. So I do a primary reconstruction. This is a common thing which I do. I take a step here, the sculptured cartilage spur, and I can sculpture it so nicely that I can make a groove for the head of the stapes and a slit for the stapedial tendon. With this technique, I can lock the cartilage over the head of the stapes and also the height should be, and also thoroughly wash, wash, wash. That is very, very important. We wash with hydrogen peroxide and betadine solution. That is very important. This I learned from my beloved teacher is to do always this. So thorough washing is very, very important. And then this is very important to obliterate this. See the cavity problem, how I prevent is, this is very, very important. We take a post soft tissue. First thing is you keep below my platform bone, elevate the supralabyrinthian area. If you don't do that, post the the uh, graft will plaster over the supralabyrinth area and there'll be a cavity and uh, that will cause problems. So always I obliterate with this. This soft tissue, when it comes in contact with the bone, it'll have vascularity and it's not shrink. Little overcorrection I do always. Like this, this is obliteration of supralabyrinth and sinoidal angle is very, very important. Now, if you look like this, the whole cavity will be safe. There is no pocket, there's no any... Uh, hums or uh, pits. So like that, we obliterated this. And now this is a sapis is there. That is the platform of bone I created. And then I keep little gel foam into the station tube orifice. And as I told, see, look at this. My graft will be always thin and transparent. This is also very, very important. If you take a nice thin graft, the post optically the graft will be very thin and the vibration of the new graft will be good. And the results, the hearing results will be better. So like this, you see the look at the size of the graft. It is almost completely covering the uh, whole mastoid cavity. So now I touch the graft anteriorly over the annulus and like this reflect back the tympanometer flaps of reflecting back tympanometer flaps. See how I do reconstruction. This is my technique. I'm very, very happy. This will remain forever without a seal. I have locked the cartilage. And this is, see, reverse tipidectomy, I can reverse reflex, you can see when I cut the suck the round window, you can see how it is nicely coming out. So like this, I lock. And then this, the next step is meatoplasty is the most important thing. The meatoplasty in all cases, I do like this. This is a meatoplasty. I go a little fast forward here. And depending upon the size, now, nowadays, my meatoplasty will not be very big, not necessary because my cavity will be very small. So I need not do a very big meatoplasty as earlier I used to do. So it will be almost a very small meatal opening I'll give, depending upon the size of the cavity. So most cases, at least in 90% of the cases, I give a, I do a very narrow meal. I don't do, do much of cut, conchal cartilage. I remove only split up my conchal cartilage I remove. And then I make a slit. And this is how I do meatoplasty. I just force forward and make a T-shaped incision here and slit it. And this is superior flap and this is inferior. The most important thing in meatoplasty is this floor cartilage has to be removed. If you don't remove this floor cartilage, the spring action will not go. There will be hump and the inferiorly. That's why the, one of the most important step in meatoplasty is one has to completely remove this spring cartilage. This cartilage will be very thick at times. You can use it for osculoplasty also. 
So this is how this this is one of the important step in metaplasty is you have to remove this and then see completely I am removing this. Once if you remove this, look at this inferior flap will go back and superior flap is like this it will come and spread. Now I just uh, suture the skin margins so not to expose the cartilage so that to prevent any pericondritis. Like this I suture it and then this is how I suture it. Now after suturing it, now look at this. This is the way how I obliterate the cavity. Look at this soft tissue, so much I have. I can manipulate this depending upon see if complete cavity will be covered with this. Even if you want, I can make a split here and then obliterate. See now if you see the whole cavity inferiorly, I have elevated with the soft tissue and this is how my cavity will be obliterated with the soft tissue. At times, if the cavity is too big, I even mobilize the temporalis muscle. I, at times I do that if necessary. So now, depending on whether you can split this and lengthen the, uh, the soft tissue. I got so much of soft tissue. This is a highly vascular soft tissue. And look at this, this will be the size of my cavity at the end of the procedure. Then I just suture the superior and inferior flaps So this is how I obliterate. I never do any other technique than this. From last 30 years, I'm doing the same thing. I'm very, very happy with, and I never get any cavity problem at all. So now suture this uh, inferior and superior flaps so that it line the cavity. The skin will come over the soft tissue of the muscle. So now look at the size of the cavity. This will, be, this will remain like that forever. See the skin will be lined. So this is the size of my cavity, what I have achieved. So this will be the size of the only thing as Maravi tell, it may take little time to heal, doesn't matter. But the long term, it will be excellent. See the skin will be lined like this. And then I keep some ribbon gas, which I remove it after 15 days. So this is how I do a canal wall down procedure. And with this, With this technique, I wish cavity problem a goodbye. So I never get cavity problem, believe it or not. Look at these cavities, how it looks. See, this is the handle of the malice. Is there any cavity? No cavity at all. People speak about cavity problem, cavity problem, cavity problem. If you do this technique, honestly, in my hands, I never seen any cavity problem, at least in 96 to 97, one or 2%, yes, I get it. Sometimes this uh, soft tissue gets sloughed out. So that time I get, Otherwise, this is how my cavity is to look. You see so many, it looks so nice. You cannot make out that I had an intact canal, canal wall. And see the handle of the malice. I was telling the advantage of handle of the malice. It lifts the graft and gives a nice contour to the graft. And also this is, uh, gives a good middle ear space. Look at this cavity. Where is the cavity? Absolutely no cavity. And also you can see the ossicle reconstruction. My cartilage which I kept is there. This is the latissimus muscular dome and the cavities, sleeves, almost all my cavities will look like this. This is another case. Again, see the handle of the malleus. See, look at the cavity. See how it is shining, smooth and uniform. There's no, where is the cavity? There's no cavity at all. This looks like a post metal wall. Again, look at this another case. See, look at another case. So absolutely there's no cavity we get. At least this I achieve in more than 90% of the cases. So this is why I prefer to do, and the results will be excellent. There's no room for any second stage, anything. When I do this technique, once if you completely, the most important thing, of course, the clearance of the disease is very, very important as Ravi told. So I have to clear the disease, the nook and corners have to go. And then if you do like this, the results are excellent. I got many cases, all the cases you can see, there will be no cavity at all. We cannot see the mass at the ball at all in these cases. So next most important thing is regular follow-up is very, very important when you do canal or cholestoma cases. I got a very large follow-up. The follow-up is very, very important. Most of my patients, they come once in a year for follow-up and we follow up, but the follow-up will give a lot of these things. So like this, I got many cards which I do regular follow-up. This is very important. This is the technique what I do. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my experience on this canal wall down procedure. And I'm very, very happy with my technique and results. So this is the message from my side. Thank you, sir. That's an excellent talk.
Over to Ravi. Ravi, we can invite Professor Jackson. I think it was a beautiful presentation as always, Dr. Vijendra. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, a lot of questions coming up. I can already see a few questions uh, in the chat box. Okay. Uh, but before we get to the questions, let me invite uh, Professor. He's been sitting quietly and I would uh, love him to share his experiences. And if he has a, a presentation, we would love to see it. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for your invitation. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Ravira Malinga, and to have uh, with uh, some so great experts than uh, Dr. Professor Vijayarandra. So if I feel at home when I am talking with you. So it's a great pleasure. And also I feel at home when I speak about cholesteratoma. We did three magnificent presentations. One, to explain what it is a cholesteratoma, and the two other experts, you present beautiful technique and the, what we say, the top of the art. But there is a big problem. And this problem is from when I was resident. Why, for the same disease, some fantastic experts, very talentous in the surgery, are doing so different technique. For me, it was, it took many times to understand why it is possible for the same disease to so someone say, I destroy the canal. Some say, oh, please, you have to respect the canal. In fact, there is a nice explanation. And that canal wall and canal wall down technique this is a part of the technique. You have not finished the technique. And this is very important. It's a part of the technique. It's like to say, and that canal wall is posterior tympanotomy. It's a part of the technique. What happened at the end? And what it is at the end? You are completely right, Ravira Balingam and Professor Vijandra. You don't want to have any cavity problem. You have the same. And what you are doing, Professor Avi, you respect the canal wall. And what is doing Professor Vijayangra? He restores the canal wall. And at the end of the surgery, he told us two twice. At the end of my surgery, if you look my result, and we look the result, excellent result, it looks like an entire canal wall technique. If you have not the clinical report, you can say maybe this is not a canal wall technique. And this is a big problem. It's not a problem of definition. When you perform a canal wall down, this is a part of the surgery, what you are doing after. If you obliterate what it was very well done, you solve the problem of the cavity. If it is not a cavity, if there is no mass with cavity, it's not an open technique, it become a closed technique. You solve this problem. And what is important for me, you have a quite normal ear canal or a little bit enlarged ear canal. And this was the reason we have a good skin woodling in the ear canal for intact canal wall. And what I call modified canal wall down technique, Professor Vijandra because and the canal, ear canal is normal. If you would like to have a cure of the skin, because the skin also is wrong in the cholesteratoma, the ear canal skin uh, have a good wood healing if the ear canal is quite normal anatomic size. If it is too straight, it, it is narrow, like in atresia, we have problem. If it is too large, like in cavity, we have problem. Another comment and finish, and I move to obliteration. So to solve the problem of Canadian technique, I agree, we have to obliterate the mastoid. Now, in entered canal wall, I talk about entered canal wall. It was fantastic. It was a tube pathogenesis technique, the philosophy the cholesteratoma comes from the ear canal. We have to restore the canal, the wall, 
the barrier between the skin layer and the mucosa. Okay, so we respect the canal or we restore the canal. But we know we have 10 to 20% of recurrence in the canal wall in the long term follow up. Why? This was a, a trouble because when we decide NCAT canal wall technique, you make something wrong. We, we think about something wrong. It was a concept of uh, gas reserve of the mastoid process, reservoir of the, of the air in the mastoid process. This is a wrong idea. It was a wrong hypothesis. The gas reservoir, if it exists, is not enough because we have a mucosa very inflammatory and the gas exchanges are very high. And the station tube, even a normal station tube, and for me, the station is normal, we have no enough ventilation. If you reduce the cavity, uh, you, you need, you have my picture? Yes. If you reduce the cavity, that means behind the canal wall intact, you put some fat, some uh, muscle, as you want, some cartilage or bone, you reduce the volume of the cavity, and the station tube ventilate only the middle ear, only the tympani cavity, and this is more enough. And it was the reason after obliteration combined of intact canal wall technique, the recurrence dropped down to 1%, maximum 2% after long-term follow-up. So obliteration solves the problem of mastoid cavity on one side for canal wall down technique, obliteration of the mastoid process behind an intact canal wall solves the problem of the recurrence and the retraction pocket. So I don't know what is the name, if it is a close or open technique, this is not important, but we have to take care. And when we have an inflammatory process, very important of the mucosa layer, especially in children, to avoid recurrence after ankle canal wall, is not bad to obliterate the mastoid and the attic space, and will improve our results. This was, uh, the first publication was in 2000, in Cannes meeting by a Scandinavian uh, colleague, Merck, and we don't believe him. We don't believe he present 0% of recurrence after five years. It was incredible. He was right. He was right. Erwin officer have the same result. We have now, after long-term follow-up, only one or two percent. So we can perform obliteration at the same time or during the second look if we see a retraction pocket. This was only my participation in the round table. And I would like to ask a question to the first speaker. Uh, Muran Lindian? Muran Lindian? Dr. Mambudri, sir? Yes, I would like to ask a question. He emphasized the pathogenesis of a cholesteatoma about mucosal traction theory. That the mucosa attract. Okay. But can you explain me why we have a lot of serosotitis? And after serosotitis, we have only 1% of cholesteatoma. Can you, can you give me an explanation of that? Number is Maximum and sir is asking about your. You understand my question? Uh, I could not follow, sir. Uh, yes, I repeat. About the mucosa traction theory for cholesteatoma, you emphasize the mucosa traction theory. So this happened in serosotitis media first. You agree? Why we have so many serosotitis media? And after serosotitis media, only 1% of cholesteatoma. What is the difference? Why? There is no much more cholesteatoma. I think uh, you are a better person to answer this, sir. <laughs> you have to answer. Because when there is a contact between the mucosa of the tympanic membrane and the ossicles, there will be some mucosal trapping. And this mucosal element, they provoke inflammation. 
and this inflammation in the mucin produces cytokines probably that may be the reason for uh, bone destruction and the progression is due to, probably because of the mucosal traction when one yes, mucosa get yeah why the percentage is so low only 1% of the case why why there is cholesteatoma in the few cases after serosotitis do you have an explanation i don't know sir actually <laughs> me too i don't know <laughs> i think um, vijendra sir can answer uh, i have a question for dr vijendra and uh, professor manio we we talk about uh, the buried air cells and uh, we do know that even after a wonderful modified radical mastectomy like dr bijendra it is sometimes or often impossible to clear all the cells of the mastoid for example uh, in the supra labyrinthine area in a well pneumatized mastoid or even in the tip it keeps going on and on and on and then at some point of time you have to stop so when you stop at that point and then you put some soft tissue either as a flap or as free soft tissue we always read that when you bury air cells there will or there may be problems we don't see it all the time but we see it sometimes do you have a uh, an explanation as to why it happens sometimes what can we do to prevent that or reduce the incidence uh, any comments on that professor vijayanga you, yeah. you you answer yeah as we said sometimes uh, of course uh, about 3 days back i did almost uh, i told i was telling my residents if you give whole day i can keep on drilling it all the cells are exposed so i did my maximum which is not possible to clear completely in that situation what i do is you put a gel foam uh, with a steroid drop fill up the whole mastoid cavity and post operatively also i give steroids for this patient this works i am not coming across this was a highly cellular mastoid with cholesterol granuloma involving each and every retrofacial cells tip cells supralabin all the cells almost for nearly 3 hours i had to drill and i gave up in at the end i was not sure that 100% are cleared but in these cases what i do fill up the whole mastoid cavity with the gel foam with a dexona take dexona injection put the dexona injection and then give steroids for them for 15 days and with this i don't have any problem in such cases yeah, but what's the explanation you've given steroids you've reduced the inflammation yeah. but you still have mucosa there why yeah. wouldn't the mucosa give problem in the future what's the explanation no i because i have not got any problem this will heal very well i have not seen any problem in this is intact canal wall this is a tuber tympanic pathology what i'm talking no, i'm talking about tuber tympanic i don't care about it. if you have yeah. intact canal wall i'm good research a professor yes sir yeah i think fortunately the cholesterol did the work many times the mastoid is dense so is rare but what you say is right and this is an advantage of intact canal wall technique right. if you have intact canal wall technique you have not to take care of this problem and this happen especially in children so it was the reason in children is better even in uh, extend cholesterol the first time to perform a conventional intact canal wall technique and if there is a uh, recurrence or if you have a um, transposition ossicular transposition to perform as a second stage to avoid the recurrence to obliterate at that time the mucosa tissue is uh, is not so secreting and so you have less chance to have some granuloma cholesterol granuloma all right, granuloma. All right. That, that's a good idea i mean that, that's true in fact nowadays uh, i would actually go to an extreme and i would do a, i talked about the cbct this morning so all my patients tubo tympanic or cholestatoma have compulsorily a ct scan and if i have a cholestatoma patient clinically and the scan shows a pneumatized mastoid i am extremely extremely careful to avoid a cavity in those patients for this reason this so is I, a contraindication of the cavity 
Yes. Oh. So, so that, that's so, something I don't do. The, uh, the other thing... Uh, one thing, Ravi, uh, yes. particularly in case of congenital cholesterol, I have seen, this congenital cholesterol, always the characteristic feature is the highly pneumatized bone. In all, that is one of the characteristic features of congenital cholesterol, highly pneumatized bone. In that case, it is very difficult. There, I take very long time to clear almost all the cells. Even though if I do a canal wall down, I clear and then as I showed the diamond bar tip, I polish, polish, polish and all the retrofacial cells and all which will be opened, I fill up with the soft tissue and then come. This exclusive, especially in a congenital cholesterol, highly cellular mastoid, we do see that. All right. I have one more question for all of you. Uh, a well done modified radical mastoidectomy or an intact canal wall procedure it all looks beautiful at the end of the procedure. But at least in my hands, I am not able to uh, predict or say when that beautiful looking reconstruction of mine is going to retract. So sometimes it's all done a few months later, a year later, it goes down, it either retracts back into the attic or it retracts into the middle ear. So I don't seem to have a control of how do I prevent it retracting in the long term? Do you have any suggestions? I put cartilage, try to support the drum physically, but I don't have a foolproof method of preventing retraction. Most of the time it retracts and stops. Sometimes it retracts and forms a colostoma again. Do you have any tips, uh, pointers to avoid that retraction? Uh, the people who do endoscopic gear surgery talk about the aeration pathway uh, isthmus, anticus, posticus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you guys have any comment or suggestions on that regard? I have, oh, I have one comment. Yeah. This happens, the frequency is in relation with the age. In okay. children, it's more common than in adults. Okay. But in adults, in adults, it happens in the long term follow up. And I have the chance to follow my patient in the long term. And I have 8% of recurrence after 10 years. Okay. During 10 years, and that kind of also was perfect. The patient was swimming, but he come back after 10 years and he have some problem. In the children is the reason before obliteration, very often in cholesteatoma in children, I add transtempanic tube, ventilated tube for this reason. And it worked well. Okay, thank you. Dr. Vijinder, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, as Professor said, this uh, <clears throat> most of the, at least eight to 10% of the cases, we do see this. So I think this is mainly because of the eustachian tube dysfunction. So when the eustachian tube is not functioning, whatever you do, it gets plastered. But when you do a canal wall down procedure and if it gets plastered, it will not cause cholesterol. Only thing hearing loss will be there, it will be a plastered drum, but a safe fear. Whereas in an intact canal wall procedure, when you do, when there is a retraction pocket, a plastered drum, there will be a simultaneously some more retraction pocket will occur. Even if you have good, uh, done a very good cartilage reconstruction, this is so powerful, this pressure, it keeps pushes the retraction for the cartilage, reconstruct cartilage, and then they will give a, 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 a retraction pocket and cholesterol. This mainly, I feel, it is a essential tube dysfunction is the cause for this. Okay, the, the, the ventilation pathways, do you really believe or subscribe to that theory? No, I mean, practically it is very difficult. I can, the, the ventilation be very good in the pre-operatively, post-operatively, I don't know why it will not work. I, I don't have a real answer for this. But practically, I've seen so many cases where I done a good job, everything. You see, after one or two years, the whole drum will be plastered. The oxycloplasty, what I've done, that will be sleeping like this. So the, there is a big difference between canal wall down and canal wall up. When you have plaster tympanic membrane on the promontorium, it's still a success for canal wall down, but for canal wall up, is an a failure. I am right. Yes. <laughs> so, Ravi, we are running okay. short of time. All right. Uh, as expected, this was the best program today. Uh, thank you for uh, your moderation. And thank you, Professor Jack Manian. Anything to tell us, sir? Thank you. We are all waiting here. Thank you. Our online team are watching you, sir. 
and, and we will look forward to having you back in India soon, Prof. Yeah, soon, sir. Yes, no. We miss you. We miss you. We miss you, sir. I was eagerly waiting to meet you. I was so thrilled when they said that you are coming. Unfortunately, we could not meet. Thank you very much for your invitation. It was an honor to be with you now, today. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, moderator, for giving me this opportunity. Oh. But only last moment I came to know that I had to speak like this. Nobody had informed me that I'll be speaking on Kenal Lord Down. When Ravi told that time only I came to know. <laughs> I didn't have any but whatever, whatever topic you gave in ontology, no, you can just you can uh, talk anything in ontology. So, and even though the presentation was so beautiful, sir. Thank, thank you, you for the presentation. Thank you. So this is the beauty of the autology. You thank see, you. The, even the Revi told anatomy preservation, even so, even after canal wall down, Vijendra sir was telling how beautifully he reconstructed the canal. So that is the beauty of the autology. Thank you, Nambudri sir. Thank you, Vijendra sir. Thank you, Professor Jack Smanian. And thank you, Revi. Thank you all. Thank, thank you for you. the good wonderful Good health. For Hi, Revi. Good health. Good health. Good health. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, sir. Thank you, everybody. We invite Dr. Mohammad Sayeed to present the memento to the chairpersons. Moving on to the next session on bronchoscopy, pediatric and adult, ENT surgeons to play a bigger role. We invite Dr. Pradeep Kumar Vidi to chair the session. We invite Dr. Santosh Kumar, head and neck surgeon, MVR Cancer Center, Dr. Preeti Kumar, consultant ENT surgeon, Patambi. Good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> Dr. Pradeep Kumar, a senior ENT surgeon who did his MBBS from Calicut Medical College as 15th batch student. And uh, he completed his MS ENT from Baroda University in 1983. Now he is practicing at uh, Ernakula Medical Center, Cochin. He has been the founder secretary of AOI Cochin and then became president. He was secretary of CSOM Society of Cochin. He has got a vast experience in bronchoscopy for more than 15 years. We invite you, sir, for sharing, enlightening us with your experiences. Good evening, uh, everyone offline, attending this conference offline and online. I thank the organizers of uh, KenCon 2021 for including this uh, topic of bronchoscopy uh, in today's deliberations. I tend to believe that uh, the decision might have hovered around one question. Have the, as far as Kerala is concerned, have the ENT surgeon lost interest in bronchoscopy? I feel to a great extent, it is true. In Kerala, each and every nook and corner of Kerala, there are one or two ENT surgeons practicing. In spite of that, quite often, uh, we see a lot of uh, problems faced by, uh, you know, whenever the form would aspiration. In a uh, when, when time when uh, we all started a career, 
we used to used to see our ENT surgeon, senior ENT surgeons engaged in uh, doing in bronchoscopy procedures with auto instruments they were available and they used to have a fairly good result. Now in Kerala, this is the scenario. Uh, ENT surgeons have been pushed to the back, pushed to the background, and it's uh, mainly dominated by pulmonists and pediatric surgeons. In Kerala, as I said earlier, there is every place there is an ENT surgeon. Uh, in the fold of AOI, outside the fold of AOI, a lot of ENT surgeons. In spite of that, we see, we very often see this sort of uh, newspaper media reports. A lot of children are dying because of sudden bottom body aspirin. They didn't die because of, uh, they just, it just got lodged in the bronchoscope, bronchus. They didn't die because of that. They died because it was blocking the larynx or the trachea. If our ENT surgeons had the basic uh, knowledge about how to do these things, I feel many of these children could have been alive by then, by now. And uh, my intention, that uh, my present, that intention of my talk today is to sensitize the younger colleagues, upcoming ENT surgeons, and not so young colleagues, also to familiarize with them the, the uh, how to handle with this uh, sort of cases, so that they could manage they could manage these cases very well. Even if they are not able to retrieve the foreign body from the tracheobronchial tree, they should be able to push it down into the bronchus and save the situation. And they should be fit enough to uh, stabilize, to stabilize to in a condition to be transferred to the higher center where better facilities are available. Mind you, sudden death in such cases is not due to the presence of foreign body in the bronchus, but due to the larynx and trachea. And all of you sitting here listening to the talk are very familiar with the air, airway of the patients. They can very well push it down or either retrieve it, push it down to the bronchus and save the child. And uh, my, my, the crux of this today's talk is to uh, enable the interstitials to have a familiarity with the um, instrumentation and uh, also to have the basic knowledge about the uh, bronchoscopy to tide over an emergency. So I'll be today's dealing, I'll be mainly dealing with the pediatric bronchoscopy and less on uh, adult bronchoscopy because the principle and practice are the same. As, a, as far as the, is, it is a diagnosis, it's diagnostic as well as therapeutic. In therapeutic, it is uh, mainly rigid bronchoscopy. Rigid bronchoscopy is the gold standard in the treatment of uh, foreign body in uh, uh, children. And uh, flexible bronchoscopy with a limited role. Some people are doing it uh, you now using it, uh, flexible bronchoscope, but I feel it's always safe to use a rigid bronchoscope in children uh, to prevent any catastrophe because some people are very good, but I am not convinced. Just to say, uh, throw some light into the uh, history is a Gustav Killian was considered the father of bronchoscopy, the first bronchoscopy in 1897 using a modified esophagoscope. And then came Chevalier Jackson, introduced the distal lighting system, then Victor Negus and Shigel or Shigatekar is ready to the uh, flexible bronchoscopy. To come to the pediatric bronchoscopy, the most common indication is a foreign body in the trachea bronchial tree. As you all know, maximum incidence is between one and three years, and at least four to five percent the block occurs in the larynx because it may be too large and, uh, as you know the aspiration is more common in children with upper respiratory infection uh, these children with the cough and uh, keep the uh, food in mouth and to cough and aspirate the symptoms clinical findings and complications all depend on all these things nature of foreign body whether it is vegetative or uh, you know inert or metallic or location of whether the trachea or the larynx or in the bronchus or the degree of obstruction whether it is uh, partial or complete how to diagnose in my opinion, as uh, 75 to 80% of cases of aspiration can be diagnosed from history alone. And out of this, for say eight, 70 to 75%, we can clear cut, make a diagnosis of where exactly is it from clinical examination alone. Just also, also observe the child, ask or tell the child, you can make the diagnosis. That is, that is in my opinion. So come to the history, 85% of cases, history is very typical. That the child chalks paroxysms of cough and cough subsides after some time. This is the typical. I have got many pediatricians uh, uh, coming, seeing the child. Uh, many times the parents will give the exact history like this. So the cough has eating, cough, paroxysms of cough, then cough subsides. By the time child reaches the pediatrician, cough has subsided, they will say that they go home. It's nothing to worry. It's good, no problem at all. 
they didn't even know sometimes they asked for a follow up they are absolutely wrong and you should ask for a follow up and there may be sudden onset of wheeze in a child not not known to have an asthma previously should have a suspicion of a foreign body in the bronchus and unexplained fever or persistent or recurrent low bar pneumonia an acute respiratory tract obstruction occurs in 5 to 6 percent of cases clinical features typical in foreign body in the larynx and tracheas one group bone again divisions in another group come to the foreign body in the trachea and larynx it is a dramatic presentation acute airway obstruction all evidence of upper airway obstruction will be there and management as you know at the site you have to dig at the public at the site avoid retrieval with the fingers don't put your finger and pull it down you pull it out don't try to do that you will be more put is more impaction and first aid as you all know you all the first aid for such a body i need not to elaborate on that including helmets for maneuver in all the children has to be educated probably have to be educated about that and the hospital when the patient is brought to the hospital in the emergency room in a very critical stage and a gasp you know very much um, distressed and uh, with the falling uh, oxygen saturation first you have to the oxygen support the mass and by the time you are mobilizing all the equipment for the bronchoscopy you can put a large iv cannula into the cricothyroid membrane if not good you can put a you could do a, even a cricothyrotomy and in selected cases and if you see that is blocking and try is going to die on and in the emergency room can you go to a emergency tracheostomy you see this child this child was brought to the my hospital at around 10 o'clock a child suddenly had a bout of vomiting and uh, uh just one minute please please uh, please please ah yes okay fine there is so all evidence of upper airway obstruction is there so i, I decided it is very absolutely very sure that your cells producing a, a, it was there is a, a problem in the trachea and or in the larynx so it did demer immediately he was taken to the theater and uh, we did uh, this is a rigid wrong this is using a zero degree endoscope with most of you have 4 mm zero degree endoscope we see a just a, just a glimpse of a foreign body and the subglottic area i pushed it down into the trachea and this is trying to get is being retrieved from the trachea uh, either you can if it not possible you can push it down into the bronchus i'll be safe you can retrieve it from the bronchus later and this is on position and this is the obstruction if the action was not at that particular time child will be lost so what i would say that if you are seeing such a child in the emergency room try to do it is you try to wish like all of you have got a zero degree endoscope try to wish put it in anesthesia try to see it push it down child will be saved so in the foreign body in the wrong bronchitis treatment surgery is different in the first few hours chest signs are due to changes in the audible due to the Uh, changes in air flow there will be audible click you are uh, may be uh, felt in the audible click even some parents may say so you are there hearing some noise after uh, this uh, this incident and fluttering noise or unilateral respiratory wrong a unilateral reduction of air entry it's only after 24 hours all the changes comes so changes of pneumonic changes or anything come in uh, there will be the signs of pneumonia may start and uh, vegetable bowel for and we are very well known notorious to have an intense inflammatory reaction later if it's not handled it will produce a produce a mucosal uh, swelling and uh, block of the airway to the bronchus mectasis uh, atelectasis of the distal of the of the lung as well as the lung abscess can ensue the radiological evaluation uh, it is good say so x-ray neck chest ct scan which should bronchoscopy i usually take first i take only x-ray if i can make a clear cut diagnosis out of that i stop that but in sometimes we have to do an x ray neck and in selected cases if you are in doubt whether it is gone not or not very sure you have to in the, go um, going for a ct scan or which along goes the x ray finding valve the x ray finding in first 24 hours don't expect any change in the x ray unless it is a metallic foreign body not expect anything i have, I have seen some pediatrician we seeing the x ray and telling the parents that there is nothing there they need not to worry first 24 hours even a child has expected you don't expect any change in the x ray and after that it changes maybe a hyperinflammation of them sometimes metallic foreign body mutualized that can if not managed to produce atelectasis pneumonia and uh, surgical immediate nephrosyma cystitis this is an x ray of the of one and a half year old child with a definite history of asthma history is very typical that's you said most important in my opinion is history take a proper history 
this is the history of very typical x ray was normal so still because in the history was very typical i decided to do the bronchoscopy and uh, this is a zero degree endoscope uh, which you all you have they are going into the uh, you know the vocal cord down into the um, trachea seat which they are resting there so it was uh, retrieved from the uh, this there the, from there and uh, uh, this is this is subsecting so the history is very important so sometimes this foreign body may be seen you see a very small radio pack try really calmed in the um, uh, general practitioner who detected this this very small uh, radio pack foreign body close to the mediastinum and the child had aspiration of a tv remote bulb it was a wire attached to that sometimes you may see the obstructive emphysema later it comes later after 24 to 48 hours or more than that on the one side you see the normal x ray on the other side you do see the hyperinflated lung on the left lung is hyperinflated with the mediastinum is pushed to the opposite side with the tracheal you push to this side you have to observe these things i have seen many pediatrics missing such an x ray so this is because as you know you are familiar with this reason this one it's a ball well phenomenon as you can see the track the bronchi and the trachea has got the power to expand during inspiration it will so it will allow air, air to go inside when there is a vegetable board body produces a mucosal reaction mucosal swelling and when the outside when the flow, air has to flow outside that produces a block that causes a ballooning of the lung that's called hyperinflation it's called ball well phenomenon everybody is familiar so come to the ct thorax on one side you see the coronal image we can see the left lung left bronchial air shadow is blocked and this is the same patient with the visual reality image the left left is blocked this is also be useful so in, in the selected cases you may have to resort to this um, virtual image a uh, virtual bronchoscopy so this is a 3d image uh, um, superimposed images going to the trachea into the carina uh, into the bronchus and division so the bronchus and is reach up to the terminal bronchial so this is very useful tool this is superimposed with high resolution 3d images which you should be we should be can visualize if they have for this is a normal thing normal one we can easily pick up when there is a foreign body so these are the places where you should expect the um, uh, foreign body landing and left and right and right lung has got an almost 25 degrees angulation from the side of the from the angle of the and no no in the line of the trachea and but it is little more acute it is 45 degrees on the left side so in adults it is more common in the right bronchus but in children the incidence of foreign body is such as the more on equal on both sides it's uh, now he have reached at a diagnosis somebody something has gone into the trachea and uh, bronchi now is the management how should the lung management larynx and trachea just like the video which showed earlier is very urgent you have to do an urgent bronchoscopy there is no doubt about that but in bronchi i you i always prefer to do planned bronchoscopy suppose the child child is brought up at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night with the history and findings of a foreign body in the right right bronchus i will not do at that time because it is always better to have in the right atmosphere right ambience the right is kind of set is right nurse right uh, theater assistant it's always good to have an you know do it very pleasant to do at that time rather than doing at the late night because it will not produce in much problem but the picture is different in the first one so this is bronchoscopes a bronchoscopy it can be done with a flexible procedure flexibility is always used for a, a diagnosis of the rigid it come to the uh, the therapy this is a one year old child uh, brought with the history of um, a foreign body uh, aspiration you see this uh, this is the um endoscope bronchoscopy was done it was a very clear cut case so you see the trachea then go into the carina examine the you see there is is blocked in the blocked in the right bronchus so uh, that uh, it, this can be uh, this was recovered uh, retrieved from the, using an optical forceps this is an optical forceps i use i picking up from the right bronchus you have to catch the bronch uh, foreign body grasp without slipping it off and it was uh, remote uh, it's a good one we did fairly good bronchoscope but remember after doing a remove the bronchoscope you have to do a check bronchoscopy in all cases of aspiration you have to do a check bronchoscopy either with it, if the bronchoscopy in place you can do it is a straight away use a, a scope through that or you can use either you say rigid uh, rigid bronchoscope uh, sorry endoscope or flexible bronchoscope
now they you know the almost most important thing is that before starting this procedure you have to check everything on the trolley that everything is proper and proper light mos forces forcing everything you have to check because you have to most important thing is that you have to reduce the contact time of the bronchoscope you know, with the mucus to the minimum possible most minimum possible so that everything it will be there. you should not be searching for the place as the cyst to come they take it out like that everything you on the table remember the narrowest portion the children in the rectangular tree is the cricoid not the glottis so when you will select the for a bronchoscope it should be right size to fit the cricoid not the glottis so that has to be kept in mind so these are the uh, instruments which i uh, have all okay this table i i have kept i have pasted on the uh, the box which has uh, it's contained in the bronchoscope this is table to select the bronchoscope this i got many many years ago from the old old uh, edition of scott brown which i am still using that many many other new tables are, have come i any you can use any of those so what are the instruments which use is like either conventional forceps or an optical forceps conventional forceps may be useful in emergency you cannot search for an optical force and do it when the child is very sick and, and almost dying you may have to use a conventional force so also if the child is smaller than 1 and 1/2 years you cannot use an optical force because there may not be not be sufficient the jaw opening space will not be there you may have to use a conventional force so this is the just uh, for to my younger colleagues who are not familiar with the, the instrumentation i just showing this is it audible so in this culture the other one is for the anesthetic tube and i just uh, running fast so this is the optical forces again to familiarize with you these instruments oh now that's uh, i don't think uh, you want to use it now. oh sorry so this will fit into the this uh, broad lens will fit in onto the um, optical forces together we will go into the um, bronchoscope the challenges are many because the narrow air space is very narrow and should ensure the contact space will be the minimum and uh, you have to the air space will be you know shared by the anesthetist and uh, so so how to introduce the endoscope that's also just uh, you, you have to know so do always ask the patient ask the anesthetist to show you the vocal cord with the straight blade macintosh forceps then introduce the scope that's the way how you have to introduce you now the anesthetist is showing me the vocal cord i'm introducing the um, rigid endoscope you all you have, all of you have with you now you can visualize on the monitor you can either enter the monitor through the uh, entering into the larynx into the trachea can i fast forward please a little any how to fast forward now going to the uh, trachea then reach the carina yeah that's all so if you can, don't see any if you sure that something has gone wrong you are not seeing on the uh, when you're seeing in the with the rigid endoscope you can use this um, flexible bronchos flexible scope under anesthesia i am putting it to the igel uh, igel you can reduce it through the igel then uh, visualize the uh, you now visualize in the epiglottis into the trachea and uh, sorry vocal cord entering into the larynx how can i fast forward this please can you show me please please help me the trachea entering the carina into the one of the bronchus entering into the uh, sorry left bronchus 
all the divisions of the bronchus can be seen then uh, at again uh, and the fast forward again in the fast forward nothing now it is a and it's not possible uh, it is save time okay okay then i go no no shit oh shit okay thank you so after uh, just visualizing the, the, that was a normal one nothing was seen then uh, when you have put in normal when you, the next is uh, you have visualized the bronchus uh, foreign body there you have to introduce the scope again ask the anesthetist to show you the vocal cord with a, a straight blow forward straight uh, blade forceps introduce the scope bring it near the vocal cord turn it to 30 90 degrees to it to come in line with the uh, vocal cord enter the in larynx beyond the vocal cord then again back and uh, to the uh, so that it fits well it will not injure the bronchus so this is a child 3 year old uh, boy with his aspiration went into cyanosis and respiratory resuscitated the local hospital suddenly had you know just almost dying when the child was there in the local hospital i really called in the pediatrician who immediately intubated the child and they just sent in a, with the ventilation uh, on ventilator so i decided to do the bronchoscope i am sure that it has slipped on back it was the child was saved because it has gone from the larynx when the vocal cord even done went down i was very sure on the history itself now it has come it went down and is getting lodged in the uh, right bronchus now child is saved because uh, just because of the action of the particular pediatrician now this i am being uh, taken out with the uh, optical forceps this is the forceps which can catch it and uh, pick it from uh, the bronchus they would i want to show you but uh, um, time doesn't allow me and it's not possible to fast forward also so i just yeah i just move that so there are multiple foreign bodies were there uh, uh, just uh, all removed so this child this uh, one year one year old one year old child one year old 15 months or so with history has pressure this is what i said history is important this girl lady gave the correct history child was um, you know catching a piece of uh, coconut was uh, just tipped over something and suddenly coughed and as and then cough 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 and and pediatrician and this in the uh, you know ignored that history so after one week when the child was brought to her hospital this history, this was the x ray there is a hyperinflation on the one side and that is a medias need to show the diagnosis very sure not not much investigation is needed so i decided to do the bronchoscopy again remember this is the zero degree endoscope now in seeing going to the going to uh, into the trachea into the carina bronchus nothing easy on the left side you see the uh, some discharges coming down coming uh, this is a pulmonary discharge not possible to fast forward and very difficult i don't want to show you all i mean just dive in very it will uh, we have to do in fine to see at the end any anyway what do you wish not possible to fast forward oh very difficult so there's a lot of um, uh, granulations in the um, yeah, there's a stuck in that in the bronchus i sucked out the granulations and uh, um, so after meticulously clearing the secretion sac- secret uh, now sucking out the granulations then uh, i could visualize the bron- foreign body uh, i would have saved time if i had uh, i could uh, fast forward this so this the ultimately i could see the foreign body there a lot of granulations were there all these things are meticulously removed sucked out and uh, very difficult this is uh, you now we have to can you can do the sucking out with the suction tube itself and the uh, only thing is that to take some time to clear the uh, every granulations and uh, once everything is uh, cleared you can see the um, clear air passage child was completely cleared and it has got to sweet for this within by the within two days it's not coming okay i'm skipping that so this are uh, foreign body that is sir in the trachea after uh, just to show, just to tell you at the end you could see all the air passage very clearly 
So keep in mind the possibility of multiple foreign body. I'm just skipping this. And since another child is a two-year-old uh, child with a non-dissolving nova pneumonia, in spite of antibiotics for two to three weeks, the pneumonia is persisting. So we uh, decided to. Uh, so history, there is no history of any uh, aspiration, but uh, X-ray showed any pneumonic conversion, just not responding to the antibiotic. Uh, the uh, antibiotic. Uh, now the, the, the child decided, "I am in the bronchus. I am in the right bronchus." What you see is the thick pus coming from the uh, from the one of the lesions of the bronchus. Thick pus. So it just meticulously sucked out everything. You can see a creamy pus coming down, coming up. It is thick, creamy pus. So once it took about 15-20 minutes to suck out all this thick, creamy pus from the bronchus. Once everything has removed, the foreign body which was obstructing the bronchus was visible. It is seen in the X-ray of in the video. Uh, it takes some time, uh, time doesn't allow me to show you. So what is the role of endoscopes in um, the pediatric bronchoscopy is uh, di rigid endoscopy as well as the flexible scope. And uh, rigid endoscopy is diagnostic, retrieval of foreign body as well as check bronchoscopy. And flexible is diagnostic, retrieval is doubtful, and check bronchoscopy, yes. So this is again a three-year-old child uh, with a, a foreign body. This is, uh, there is no history, I said. You would see sometimes God save us sometimes. You know, this is a foreign body. There's a lot of mud in the wrongness. Everything was completely accepted. It's something which was remaining there, which couldn't be removed. So I decided to do it about two, two days. By the time had child cuffed out and brought out everything and check wrongness, give it on two, three days back, it was normal. Failures do happen. And then it's a narrow old child. It's just airlifted from Lakshadweep. As per the, the, the X-ray which I had shown is there, T as per the uh, TV remote bulb. And this is the X-ray which I showed you, just picked up by the general practitioner there. I uh, clearly calmed on him. So he decided to do the um, uh, bronchoscopy. This is us blocking in the right bronchus, the, the TV bulb. I try I trying to remove it from the uh, bronchus, which is not coming. It got uh, some that that wire attached to the uh, foreign body was uh, entangling somewhere. It was not coming on. In spite of trying for half an hour, it didn't come. Uh, it just gets stuck there. So finally, I decided to abandon the procedure and uh, uh, ask my friend, uh, radio um, cardiothoracic surgeon, to intervene. So I took a CT scan, located the thing, and did did the. Uh, minimal access, uh, it's good in minimal access thoracotomy, and uh, he did this, uh, removed this foreign body. There is another evol evolving, uh, this thing, uh, I think there's a cryo extraction. Uh, I am, uh, I am not, uh, I, I don't know about these things, this thing particular, I, am, I, I don't have any knowledge, knowledge about, practical knowledge about these things. This I got from my pulmonology friend. This is a cryo, cryo probe, uh, which can go into the thing, uh, into even places where are inaccessible with the rigid scope. It's like terminal divisions of the bronchus. But it is applicable only for the vegetative or vegetable foreign body. You introduce this through either a rigid scope, rigid uh, scope, then uh, introduce it there. And uh, this by rapid freezing and thawing and the deep freezing produces a uh, um, freezing of the foreign body. It gets stuck to the cryoprobe and they'll be pulled into the rigid scope and removed it. This is a cryoprobe which is shown this uh, is crystal costly. This uh, probe costs about, uh, I am told that is about 1.8 lakhs, but can be used for 100, 100 cases. So 18 to 20,000 20, rupees, uh, it, is, uh, it will save it from a thoracotomy if it is uh, get lodged in the uh, terminal divisions of the bronchus. Anesthesia in bronchoscopy is very important because whatever, whatever success which have, I give, uh, I take 50%, I give 40% to my anesthetist and 10% to my staff in the theater. Because uh, it's very important. You have to um, brush, you have to brief the anesthetist what you are going to do. And he should be aware, he should be very much clear cut idea about what you are going to do. And uh, I would advise you have got the three e anesthetists and uh, just familiarize all of them with the, uh, this procedure because at the, in an emergency, one or other may be available. Then relative contraindications in the bronchus is difficult upper airway, severe nephrosis, uh, trismus, macrolosia, and mandibular disease. And complications do happen. Injury to the larynx, subglottis. I, I reiterate once more, you remember in pediatric bronchoscopy, it is the uh, cricoid area, which is uh, very narrow. 
so after you good doing a good surgical procedure and remo- coming out after remain the foreign body child may go in for a subglottic edema if you are damaged the mucosa or the uh, subglottic region an injury to esophagus and everything will be then and you have to keep in mind you have to reduce the contact time uh, to the minimum adult bronchoscopy uh, the in, uh, in adults it's a more of it's a, i think it is still a domain of the pulmonologist because the therapeutic uh, lot of therapeutic procedures are done by the flexible bronchoscopy but in case of uh, a foreign body in the bronchus where you have to do a rigid bronchoscopy you have to intervene and uh, but the principles and practices are the same only thing is that the tension is less in adult because we have got a sufficient airway to handle the instruments the principles are the same so how to train yourself you have there is no um, hands on training will be available for the digit bronchoscopy but uh, mannequins you have to train with the mannequins or a cadaver sheep cadaver god cadaver with the lungs which can be very useful you have to if you are really serious about it you have to use it i really compliment uh, dr sunil j of kerf kollam he organized a very good workshop in 2019 uh, he had arranged all this uh, uh, mannequins and cadaver which is a very good job i really compliment him for that success depends on teamwork this is a teamwork i have said earlier this is a real teamwork you have to work hand in hand with the anesthetists or the surgeon or the nurses and everybody should be ready they should be taught how to handle to reduce the x to one point reduce the contact time with the uh, with the mucosa so uh, if this talk has re- instilled any any tick tickling in your mind to take up this bronchoscopy and you are there to save those children Uh, who are yet to die best time to die unless you take up an interview in time if you are there i am happy with that thank you very much thank you sir uh, actually uh, i had fortune to do my post graduation from jipma there most of the pediatric bronchoscopies most of them means all of the uh, pediatric bronchoscopies were done in ent department in kerala the situation is otherwise it's mostly done in pediatric surgery department i think so actually that's why there we had a lot of exposure there often we used to get uh, some funny cases it's actually not funny it's another um, real emergency like strider uh, sometimes uh, if we are not acting in time we may lose the patient that is the problem so like in uh, some interesting cases like if the child we are making him supine position the child will get cyanosed but the when he is made up upright position everything will be normal saturation will become normal everything everything will become normal but there is no history actually as sir told the key point is diagno- key point in diagnosis is the history the patient or the biased patient means patient cannot tell usually it is the uh, ch- children okay and uh, some of the uh, what is your experience with metallic foreign body sir like yeah. metal ball in rattle ah uh, yeah metal metal is uh, rather you know rather easy because diagnosis out there evident yes. on the x-ray but it and is very difficult to remove because once we uh, catch hold of that depends on the shape of the body that is yes. that you have to shape of the body is spherical it is very difficult to grasp it will slip away from slip the force of the like but if the, if the shape is okay we can catch that it's um, um, either with the peanut fossil so we can catch it mm-hmm. or sometimes with the uh, alligator for this uh, alligator fossil that was the thing which uh, yeah. i felt most difficult to catch hold of it yeah yeah we used to get other for vegetable foreign bodies usually other for sapota yeah. seed groundnut seed uh, coconut pieces this were the other usual foreign bodies which we usually get okay uh, we had an interesting case like uh, a six months back a 10 year old boy came to us and told he had swallowed aspirated actually, he had swallowed a whistle black whistle whistle yeah okay. whistle is very common okay common. but that was six months back but nobody only his only symptom was cough cough yeah okay but uh, on exhaling in a particular position when exhaling that sound will come yeah, yeah. it was just like uh, there is a uh, one movie kalabo mani was uh, so swallowing because, uh, the center. whistle has got a hole inside yes. child continue to continue to breathe there yes. sometimes you know uh, it can you can that says it remains for a longer time 
Yes. All X-ray and uh, physical examination were normal, and yeah, the CT scan was showing just a thickening there. Yeah, yeah. And because the hole, through the hole inside the vessel, mm -hmm. child continues to breathe. Yes, you know, there is much obstruction there. But after remaining there for a long time, you produce a musical reaction, granulation, just like that which you had to show me. Then they start producing symptoms sometimes. Yes. And uh, uh, my request to other my younger colleagues is uh, actually if you are training in this bronchoscopy, two advantages are there. One is uh, you will get more confidence with the airway because uh, the anesthetist is actually uh, paralyzing and giving to us. If we are, if we have getting the confidence to do bronchoscopy, the airway you are becoming master of the airway, like tracheostomy. Uh, we can avoid a tracheostomy, but we have to intubate. It's just like intubating. Yeah, yeah but I will see that now. Even if you couldn't, you couldn't uh, retrieve a foreign body from the bongas, make the child stable and safe from the clutches of death. Then you are doing a great job. So if once it goes into the bronchus, the child is saved. It will not produce any death at that time. Uh, so no foreign body in the bronchus obstructing the body will not cause death immediately. It produces death only after uh, a, lot, I mean, a lot of time. Don't think that this is a very simple thing. It's very, uh, the complications are many, even uh, respiratory injection, in, no, apart from the injury, all sorts of complications have to be explained to the uh, parents. They should not assume that you say, as if you are going, just putting a thing into the longus and take it out. It's not like that. All sorts of complications, including possible death, may have to be explained to the parents. Then only go about it that. But I would, I would just suggest you take up, uh, you know, a bit more uh, enthusiasm. Second thing is, once you remove it completely, like any other foreign body, 100% result. No other problem, like... Uh, ah, yeah, we have to. The check bronchoscopy is very important. Sometimes it can have, has happened with many. Unless they do the check bronchoscopy, there may be second body, wrong body, wrong body third wrong body, like that, maybe there. And um, Shajis, Shajis is a master in this. Shajis said, uh, any comments on this? Shajis is a master. He no. was kind enough to do this lot to me. He himself is a master in this. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 sir. I mean, it's, uh, uh, we are doing a lot of cases, but uh, not like you. Uh, as you said, uh, it is a complicated procedure, but uh, a life-saving procedure. Only maybe the, this is the immediate life-saving procedure in END. Uh, after the procedure, if we come out uh, to the bystander, that uh, when you see the face, it is fantastic. That is the experience. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, no, so, it's a very, it's a real life saving procedure, especially in an emergency. Sir, it's a real uh, have you had any experience of needle uh, aspiration? Here, unfortunately, I didn't have any needle. We had uh, uh, five, six cases of uh, parda pin. Parda pin. Uh, yeah. Usually what they do is uh, during uh, this, uh, wearing this parda, they keep the pin there. Uh, somebody talk to you, they will yeah. immediately yeah. aspirate. Yeah. And, uh, should not be different. Sometimes it won't be seen in a chest x-ray PA view, no? Yeah. But you, it, you it, 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 it can be seen in x-ray. Only thing is, uh, uh, which part is upward, that is the issue. Sharper uh, part is upward or... Uh, head on, head on, we, we won't yeah. get it. So, yeah. we have to take lateral view also. Lateral view. Oh, you have to be, oh, you have to take both the views, that's all. X-ray, PA view, lateral view. And uh, neck also, if you done. And if in doubt, go on CT, go in doubt, again, perpetual bronchus will be like that. Normal pin, it is easier to remove, even if it is... Uh, but the open safety, safety pin is difficult. When it's, it is open, it's upright. not always easy because yes. it can injure trachea and uh, sharp anywhere yes. near that. Yes, yes. So, but if we can hold off that uh, sharp part, if you can hold on, it is very uh, good. This open safety yeah. pin means, uh, yeah, even good. if we yes, hold yes. the sharper part, the yeah. other part is there. Every, every case is a challenge. Every yeah. case. Don't take it anything lightly. Even if it's a um, uh, ground nut. Don't take it as silly. It's every case is a challenge. Groundnut uh, is a, challenge. yeah. Groundnut is a very difficult for anybody because if you catch it, it will, it can break down and uh, spread over both the bronchus. So the only thing is that if you have got doubt and you are almost convinced that there is a foramen in the bronchus, don't delay it for neck day, neck day, neck day like that. 
and then uh, if possible at the very next day itself don't do that next thing, the, next thing is it can create uh, chemical pneumonitis so the thing is worse that thing and the uh, copra uh, coconut uh, can create uh, um, this thing chemical pneumonitis i think that maybe in the next two, four or five years uh, shajid will be able to bring more and more no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you must be very fast no yeah, yeah. you must be very fast See, you must you must be very fast oxygenation must be will be initial. not on not the oxygenation level you have control it so only and as wind light and only thing is that you have to reduce that is it emphasize you have to reduce the contact time of the bronchus mucosa with the scope to the minimum possible to avoid any sort of post operative edema you have to reduce to the minimum that's why i said it should be very fast yes, very fast Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. You have any doubt? Because uh, Sajid was kind enough to allow me to discussion. Any 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 questions from the audience? I'm willing to pick up because uh, now we didn't take it up. Please, thanks, Tess. No, now, thank you. Huh? Now we will have the live quiz. What? Ah, okay, good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So, I specifically, once more, thank um, for uh, uh, the organizers, Ken Con. not for not only for giving the miss slot but for how they had the courage to organize the cancon on this uh, virtual platform it was excellent thank you very much thank you we invite the chair persons to present the memento to the faculty we invite dr bg raj to present the memento to the chairpersons the live quiz is on the next session is on cyloendoscopy by dr bini faisal to chair this session we welcome dr vivek sashidharan dr rajiv good evening everybody uh let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and it is uh, really wonderful and uh, i feel really happy to be back and see so many familiar faces uh, yeah so my uh, topic for today is cyloendoscopy actually it is quite vast so i have tried to restrict myself to obstructive cyloadenitis and uh, as you know cyloendoscopy is useful for uh, the ductal pathologies basically and if you are seeing it nothing like seeing it so that is a most specific investigation and uh, for i think for the past uh, 10 years i have had almost 600 cyloendoscopies and uh, many salivary glands could be saved because of that so just brushing through the history the first person to describe is uh, hippocrates and uh, sorry and uh, you all will be knowing about the wartens duct then stensons in the parotid and the bartholinus who described the sublingual duct system and uh, thanks to carl stroh we all have lot of endoscopes and so many minimally invasive procedures are possible though it was first described by philip buzini and uh, the first cyloendoscopy uh, was described by a maxillofacial surgeon there are many maxillofacial surgeons in this field then it was later popularized by one more maxillary surgeon that is nehleli that is in israel and equally same time started in switzerland that is by marshall and in india it was started by pp singh 
and that was in 2009. And I would like to tell you about the Salindoscopy Group of India, which started in three years back. Just to get an idea about how a nasal endoscope and a cylindroscope will look, you can see that compared to a 4 mm cylindroscope, that is the picture you get from a 1.3. And the view is again through water, so the vision is going to be less. So this is a functional unit of the salivary gland. I will not be going into the details of it. And just to tell you, in the resting stage, 75% of your saliva is secreted by the submandibular gland. And in the stimulated, the majority is by the parotid. So each gland has its role. So you cannot just remove them. And this is a cylindroscopic anatomy. Generally, it is five to six centimeters. The opening is called as a papilla. And uh, it is very narrow say 0.5 millimeters, submandibular papilla is still narrower, 0.2 to 0.5. So they say submandibular papilla is difficult to navigate and, uh, sorry, difficult to cannulate, but once you cannulate, it is easy to navigate. For the parotid, it's the reverse. So you have the hilar area, which can be bifurcating or trifurcating. And from there, you have like very much like the bronchus, you have the second level, third level like that. How will I know the time? It's not set. Okay, so the indications uh, are basically obstructive pathology and inflammatory. I'll be restricting myself to obstructive. And uh, the history, patient might be coming to you with a lump or a discharge or uh, mealtime syndrome. Sometimes number of salivary glands will be involved. There could be dryness of the mouth. And if you have someone coming with a postprandial syndrome, if it is yes, it is quite possible it is an obstructive sialadenitis. So the work has to be in line of either a calculus or a stenosis. Or if you feel it is an inflammatory, you have to find out whether it is an acute or a chronic thing. Now, if it is a chronic, it could be anywhere from a juvenile recurrent parotitis, the Sjogren's radiation, like depending on the history. And sometimes some of these inflammatory can present because of the docitis, they present with obstructive symptoms. So actually all these things are overlapping. So the investigations, somehow uh, ENT surgeons do not uh, have much liking for the x-rays, but these are quite cheaper and uh, uh, the dental surgeons do it. So for the whoever is for the postgraduates here, it is the um, submental view, sorry, uh, uh, puff cheek appearance, PA view for the parotid stone. Submandibular, you all are familiar. <laughs> now in the ultrasound, uh, the calculus is characteristic. You can see that there is a bright curvilinear echo. How can I show the cursor cannot be shown? I want the regular, uh, just call somebody, will you? Can I have the main screen, please? Uh, so you have, uh, Yeah, it is a bright curvilinear echo. Uh, one of you, please come here, please. Uh, so there's a bright curvilinear echo and there's a posterior acoustic shadowing here. So can I have the proper screen? Oh, you need the other one. Okay. We'll yeah. So um, that is characteristic of calculus. So yeah. Yeah. Now I think the cursor is seen there. Yeah, so you can see this, the posterior acoustic shadowing. This is characteristic of calculus. Um, so uh, if you are in a parotid and you are suspecting a calculus, a, resp uh, a responsible sonologist, he's reporting there is no calculus, the chances are it is true. Because parotid, uh, I mean the ultrasound is quite sensitive for parotid gland. On the other hand, if it's a submandibular, the so-called coma area. Coma area is where the superficial part hooks over the mylohyoid to form the deep part. That part is missed and the distal third is missed. And again, in dilatation, you might miss the stenosis. And certain things about calculi are so stone less than two millimeter will be missed in an ultrasound. And uh, if uh, the uh, calcium is less than 50 to 60%, that might be missed in an ultrasound. So with an ultrasound, you have to be guarded. If uh, the symptoms are strong enough, go for a CT. Ultrasound, we can also use intraoperatively to remove uh, troublesome calculus. 
CT generally, if you want to know the number of calculus, it will tell you the correct location of the calculus. See if a calculus is beyond the third molar area, I know it is intraglandular. So I know the procedure is going to take longer. And of course it will tell you the size, the lie, if you're uh, planning for a basketing, is it favorably aligned along the duct? All these will be told by a CT. And CBCT will be a cheaper version. If you have access, you can use that. But it cannot detect uh, strictures. Now, MR silogram is an investigation uh, where actually you don't need a contrast. The saliva itself is the contrast and that will show you the dilated duct. It will tell you the exact number of strictures that will show you the pattern of strictures. And uh, this is an MR silogram which shows you the calculus there. It is quite sensitive for strictures. Uh, so in an obstructive saladenitis, the majority is due to stones, that is 60 to 70%, and around 20 will be for stenosis. And of the 452 cases we had, had around 127 were calculi and stenosis is 45, the rest all are different types of inflammatory conditions. And uh, in the submandibular gland, I mean, the majority of stones will be in the submandibular gland. The reasons, I, I will not be going into the detail. It is familiar to you, I think. And uh, generally, the stones, the area where you, where you see these stones, are one is at the hilar area and other is at the distal third. So if the symptom is suggestive, you look and concentrate on these areas. So what is the role of cylindroscopy? We know it has brought about a paradigm shift. So a rough a treatment algorithm will be, if you are having a calculus, you can think this way. Is it palpable or non-palpable? If it is palpable and accessible, silodichotomy can be done, provided uh, investigation has been done to rule out other calculi. And otherwise, of course, cylindroscopy is there. And if it is non-palpable, the option is a diagnostic cylindroscopy. And in a diagnostic cylindroscopy, again, if the stone is inaccessible, you're supposed to use assisted approaches, like you can use intraop radiology, you can use extracorporeal lithotripsy, and only if all these methods fail, you should think of a silodinectomy. So this is a rough algorithm which says stones less than three to six, I mean, less than three millimeter can be easily basketed. The intermediate stones three to six might need a combined approach. What I would say is stone of all sizes can be treated by silendoscopy using various techniques. So the instrument requirements are very simple other than the silendoscope, which is very fragile and has to be used very carefully. And you need the lacrimal dilators and you need uh, the, if, the facilities are available. You can use a Holmium Yag laser and the basket also. This is the usual uh, endoscope. You can see that endoscope is quite long and it has a distal end piece to which the camera is attached. And you have the lacrimal system and this endoscope can go in various combinations of sheath. These sheaths are the interventional where through which you can pass the instrument. So the first step will be As you know, the parotid ostium is opposite the second molar and with the lacrimal uh, dilator, you will be dilating it serially. And then with the conical dilator, you can widen it still more. And then you will be passing the diagnostic endoscope. So diagnostic endoscope passes under constant vision. Constant vision, the lumen should be in the center and constant irrigation keeps the duct dilated and the basket generally goes behind the calculus and uh, the calculus is deployed, I mean, the stent is deployed. And once you have engaged the calculus, So, uh, yeah, once you have uh, engaged the calculus, I'm waiting for it to catch so that I can drag. Okay, I'll drag on because time will be lost. And uh, at the 
ostium, what is generally done is like you try to remove it if it is if it come out through the papilla. Otherwise, you might have to do a papillotomy. So this is a submandibular calculus. Again, the same way the dilatation is done. And this is actually a combined approach. I would like to show you certain landmarks. So after the repeated dilatation, that is an interventional scope going in. So when I see the score, what I assess is if the calculus is fully seen, and uh, see, this is a landmark I wanted to show. Actually, just beyond the tongue depressor, you will be able to see the line of the lingual nerve. So if it is an intraglandular calculus or the proximal third calculus, what you will be doing is opening up that area at the second to third molar area. And uh, I just wanted to show you the lingual nerve before I go on to the next video. So see, that is a lingual nerve coming up. And as you identify the lingual nerve, you have to hook it backwards. So that is incision done to remove the calculus. So here I would like to show you an intraglandular calculus, which is quite large. There is one more small calculus seen in the tip. This is one uh, useful uh, thing which you all can try to do. This is called as uh, mini distal silodochotomy. See, this fold is by the sublingual, uh, I mean, submandibular duct. Right above, if you use cautery, you do not have sublingual gland there. So if you open there, the risk of ranula is not there. So you can isolate the sublingual duct there, and then you can open it up and do the scopy. Or uh, if there is a calculus distal, you should try to open it in this area. And here, I would like to show you it was, no, it was a large calculus. So what I uh, see, sometimes it might be associated with multiple calculus. So endoscopy will help you to retrieve all the other smaller calculi also. So this is an intraglandular calculus. Uh, for you to identify the intraglandular, if it is a small calculus, of course, uh, you'll be able to remove it by silendoscopy. But the problem is usually these people come with very large calculus. You can see that is the light of my scope. So with the help of that, I uh, trace the duct. So that is the sub, um, lingual nerve again. The muscle, it is a mylohyoid muscle which is being cut so that you are onto the superficial part of the gland. So what I would like to say is before, uh, uh, the dictum used to be if it is an intraglandular calculus, it is uh, gland removal, it need not be like it can be removed uh, the same way. And this is an endoscopic technique which uh, can be practiced by those who has a nasal endoscope, you can use something like a dilator which will guide you where the duct is going to be, and then go intraorally open the same way, just how I showed the lingual nerve is isolated, isolate, this is a duct with the calculus at the hilum, you will be able to dissect it. This will, uh, especially if it, uh, the calculus is palpable, you can remove it this way. So for a proximal submandibular stone, see this is another technique. What we do is the basket, you can see that the stone is held with the basket and then later it is used as a guide. See, with the uh, thread of the bas uh, basket inside, I, I'm getting something to hold on and from there the calculus is being traced and then the calculus will be removed. I will jump that. Now for a proximal parotid stone, proximal means proximal to the gland. So it is a deep stone. The position will be somewhere near the pinna. So with the light, we mark it and then go for something similar to a small parotidectomy incision. And then you open up the area with the light, identify the duct, open up the duct. And if you're seeing the stone, you can uh, remove it easily. If you are not still seeing it, you can do a scopy through that. So here we were not seeing it. So did a scopy through that. 
and there the stone and then went back, opened the duct still more and the calculus is removed. Such kind of removal you have to always, such kind of removal you have to always stent it. And it is oversewn with a parotid tissue. So you have non-visible calculus in silentoscopy, especially if it is near the posterior border of the parotid, you may not see it. So this is where the stone is and uh, you are not seeing it on silentoscopy. This is just to show you the accessory parotid duct opening. See, it is far ahead of the tragus and that is a small opening. And the calculus was not visible on endoscopy. So we called in the help of radiology. And you can see the needle here, and the, it is actually essentially a blind dissection, blind dissection with the help of nerve monitor, but still the nerve will be actually uh, still medial to the ductal system. So if you do it under a microscope, you're kind of safe. And they came identified still more, and then finally managed to get in the stone. So this is one interesting sublingual duct I came across. After the basketing, it was getting stuck. I was not able to find out where. The sublingual duct looked very clean. And uh, as I traced it back, I saw that, see, I saw the sublingual duct draining into the main duct. So where the red rubber tube is, it is a sublingual duct. That hooking it is a sublingual duct. So the factors affecting the removal are, if it is mobile, it is very good size, less than three to four millimeters. We know like it will easily come out within minutes with basketing. Shape is very important. And whether it is adherent, non-adherent, if it is in the primary duct, but uh, physiological restrictions, adherent calculus, peripheral stones, impacted basket, there can be the causes of failure, but with the use of combined approach, you can still retrieve the stones. Now, if you come to the second important cause, that is a stenosis. Stenosis can come in uh, different patterns, like it can come in one particular ductal system, you call it as a diaphragmatic stenosis or a short segment stenosis, long segment or entire segment. These things you actually see when you're doing a cylindroscopy. So this is actually, you can see it is a diaphragmatic stenosis. You can see the duct, dilated duct beyond it. So you can dilate it with the rigid endoscope. So it is uh, basically dilating it with a rigid endoscope, moving back and forth. For the purpose of saving time, I'll show you the next one also. This is the narrow duct system, which is being dilated by balloon. See, that is the balloon, which is dilated 0.3 to 0.4 ml of uh, um, saline will be pushed in. Or even air will be pushed in, kept for around one to two minutes, and then retrieved. So this is again a case of uh, stenosis and rigid dilatation. In uh, generally, you will be seeing the lumen. When there is stenosis, you will be just seeing the dilated wall. So it is like how blind men move, moving the wall. That way, you have to grope with the endoscope, like sliding along the wall and uh, turning to, hoping to find out the opening. And somewhere over here, see that is a uh, narrow segment. I'll just drag it down, yeah. See, so you can see what is called as a tracheolization of the mucosa. These are called as rigid constrictions, which you will see. And that was a narrow segment, which is again being dilated. So even chronic parotitis will have this pattern. We call it as a one in two pattern. I'll just show you the picture of a chronic parotitis. Usually see, one duct will be small, that other duct will be big. And if you go to the next level duct system, the pattern will be similar. And if there is an inflammatory edema, like it will be narrow again, it will be like a physiological narrowing. So you can use a guide wire and then go across it and again, dilate it also. So all these will act similar to a stenosis. Now, this was a case where there was total stenosis where we were not able to see the opening at all. 
and uh, patient had the entire duct system, which is dilated, which you call it as a mega duct. So it was opened. See, that is a duct opened and then the endoscope is passed. After dilatation, you will pass the endoscope and uh, this will be the view through the endoscope. Sorry, that's a stent being placed. That is a picture of chronic peritonitis. So similarly, if you have a distal submandibular stenosis, you can go for the retropapillary approach, which I was showing you. And uh, I will skip this. I hope I'm on time. And this is something called as a silo seal, where you have a stenotic segment followed by a dilated segment. So this is a narrow segment. And I'm entering into the dilated segment. As I told you, the scope is around 1.3 to 1.6. This dilated segment is two centimeters. However much you move around it, you will not be able to see it. So it takes a lot of painful time to find the other end of the opening. And that is my guide wire taking me to the other opening so that the scope can get into the other side of the duct. So while trying to do that, what happened was the outer sheath of that guide wire got uh, misplaced. To cut a long story short, short, that is the forceps trying to retrieve the loose piece of the outer coating. And then it was removed. So sometimes because of the stenosis, you have to open a fresh ostium. This is almost near the uh, first molar area. That is a near ostium of the submandibular gland. This is a combination where I had a stenosis with a calculus beyond it. So this is the stenotic segment, which is dilated by the balloon. There's a balloon dilating it. And then went on to look at the calculus. And that was basketed and removed. So generally we place the stand for two to four weeks. That was a case of migrated stent. The stent had gone far inside and then it was retrieved with the help of a forceps. It has gone into the duct system. So such complications once in a while can happen, but all can be removed without any issues. So complications uh, like just how you write for a question answer, you can list many, but generally it is a kind of safe procedure. There were around 600 cases, 277 submandibular scopies and 320 parotid. If you look at this complications, the complications were ductal perforation, which is 20. Initially, we used to abandon the procedure. Now we bypass it and we can complete the procedures. And duct avulsion were two, but I could, uh, uh, like the gland is still present. And if you look at it, there were six cases of silodinectomies in the entire uh, 600 scopies. And of these, the first uh, four or five will be in the first five years. After that, I think the last five years were fairly okay. So there is a learning curve. And with the learning curve, you tend to improve also. So I would like to say that silendoscopy is uh, outcome wise, it is quite safe and an effective procedure and you can salvage many salivary glands. And uh, I think it should be taken up by many people in the field. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Bini for that uh, very detailed uh, talk on uh, silendoscopy and for sharing your vast experience with the audience. I think we are already running uh, behind schedule. So I think uh, we wouldn't be taking up any questions. If there is any, I'll be able to ha happily take yep. the chat box. Thank you. I request the chairpersons to present the momentum to the faculty. There is breakout room for ma'am. 
uh, if there is any question, uh, Madam will be answering the questions. And also live questions uh, active now. We invite Dr. Saeed Salim to present the momentum to the chairpersons. Thank you. The final session for today on recent trends in the management of obstructive sleep apnea presented by Dr. Srinivas Kishore and Dr. Vidya Saga. To chair this session, may I invite Dr. Sapna, Associate Professor, Government Medical College, Calicut, and Dr. Bijiraj, Consultant ENT Surgeon, Ascend Hospital. Vidya Saga, are you there? Vidya Saga, I think he is there. Srinivas, I, I think you are there. You can unmute yourself. Srinivas. Please unmute. Yes, now I could. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, very well, very well. Uh, Vidya yeah. Sagar is there or no? Is... Um, yeah, so I'm actually covering for Dr. Vidya Sagar. Unfortunately, I... he's tested positive for COVID. I know. And uh, he's, uh, he's a bit sick, so I'm actually covering for him. Yeah, um, he is, uh, he's already on online. Yes, uh, I know, I know, I know. Um, okay. But so I will be delivering the talk on his behalf. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, I mean, uh, inviting our invitation because uh, last minute, I know, uh, very difficult. But uh, uh, we're almost, uh, uh, I mean, at least those of you who know us, we're all uh, one group and we always sort of talk about the same concept. So I, um, uh, I'm always there. It is um, very kind of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Over to chairperson. Uh, this is the last talk of uh, the day today at KenCon 2021, the first day. Uh, I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Srinivas Kishore. As we know, we are talking of ramifications in ENT. And uh, obstructive sleep apnea is one such field where I think we need to have more and more youngsters come and understand more about it. It's a lot of understanding and doing the right job for the right patient. So over to you, we are uh, seeing, uh, going to hear something in a field in which he's been into and the experienced and the uh, years of experience is going to speak and tell us. Over to you, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you very much. Um, you can hear me and I'm going to start sharing yeah, my yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah, audible, you're audible. You can share your screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's seen. All right. And uh, I understand I have half uh, half an hour or should I, do I have 40 minutes? We have 30 minutes, half an okay. hour. Perfect. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you for uh, understanding that uh, my friend couldn't be there today, but um, I'll try to do my best. Um, to talk to you all about the recent advances in the management of obstructive sleep apnea. To start with, why are we even having this talk, right? We're having this talk because obstructive sleep apnea is one condition that as you've seen in the slide here, that is associated with many conditions to the extent that 91% 
of patients who have nighttime heart attacks may have obstructive sleep apnea. And this is a slide all of us know and understand, and this is what we've been seeing for decades. But what has changed? The gold standard therapy, as we all know, is PAP therapy. There is no debate about that. And all of us are supposed to give PAP therapy to our patients before even considering some other kind of management. Now, the problem with PAP is that over a period of time, if you look at this and understand this graph, which is a, a, a collection of the mean percentage of non-compliance with CPAP in published RCTs by year of publication. So this is not just random data. This is data that is published about patients who are non-compliant to the prescription of PAP therapy. So if you see right from 1996, to 2011, till which this paper has been published, the data has remained the same in terms of non-compliance. It was about 50% in 1996 to just about between 30 to 40% at the beginning of this particular decade. Now, what does this tell us? This basically tells us that the problem is not with the technology, the problem is with the human being. Humans generally don't feel like getting chained to things. PAP therapy is an amazing therapy. There is no doubt about it. But there are a set of people who will not use the CPAP or are not able to see, use the gold standard therapy for various reasons. Now, look, this, look at this lady, for example, and you would see three bindis, one below the other, and the last one on the dorsum of the nose given by the PAP therapy. Now, the multiple factors that affect the adherence of PAP therapy, like, for example, subjective sleep-related symptoms, like the ones that I showed in the earlier slide, like dryness, the, the PAP just coming out because of increased pressure, simple OSC severity, that means a patient having very high AHI, and, of course, knowledge of PAP's uh, effects. You know, they don't have, they don't understand that, you know, not using CPAP may cause a lot of problems for them. Keeping all these aside, it has been found that CPAP adherence finally boils down to two things, anatomical structure and narrow upper airway anatomy, right? Now, if, like, for example, look at this particular video wherein this patient is having an isolated primary vertically collapsing epiglottis. This is a proper anatomical structural abnormality that affects the CPAP adherence. So if you list all of them, septal deviations, turbinate hypertrophies, adenoids in adults, high arched palate, size, all of these contribute to adherence of PAP therapy. That means poor compliance to the gold standard therapy. Now, amongst all the lists that have been listed before, septal deviations and turbinate hypertrophies have been found to be having a significant impact in PAP therapy adherence. If you look at the, the results from a paper that's published by the Stanford group, if you look at this row and this row, it has been found that if you can see the, the, the row on the left side is patients who are adherent to CPAP and non-adherent to CPAP. Septal deviation patients were completely non-adherent to CPAP, whereas patients who didn't have gross septal deviations were adherent to CPAP. And the same story goes for inferior turbinate hypertrophy as well. Here is a simple uh, kind of a scale that most rhinologists use, no scale. Now, why did I bring this up? Because we as sleep apnea surgeons also use this scale. Why? If you use this scale and you find out that the patient has a score of above, above 50, giving a nasal mask to this particular patient is of no use because he is not able to use the nasal mask or a nasal pillow. Why do I say that? 
If you ask your CPAP patients and you ask them, which mask would you like to use? You would, they would obviously come and say, I would like to use a nasal mask because it's the most comfortable of the masks to use. But if you give a patient whose no score is above 50, a nasal mask, it is bound to fail. This experience will turn off the patient towards C, uh, away from CPAP for life. So us as surgeons, us as otolaryngologists, us who pe as people who look into the noses should score better than our other uh, physicians who take care of these patients are involved in the patients in the management of obstructive sleep apnea, wherein we can select the right mask for these patients by using this simple tool. Now, if you give a good treatment, especially simple nasal procedures, nasal surgery for patients who are non-adherent to CPAP, their adherence to CPAP just doubles. As it is given in this particular paper that's come from Stanford, the percentage of patients regularly using CPAP prior to nasal surgery, if it was 38.7%, the patients, the percentage of patients who were adherent to PAP therapy after nasal surgery just catapulted to 90.2%. You as an ENT surgeon, us as ENT surgeons have the capability to deliver this kind of a result by adopting the gold standard therapy for these patients by just doing a very simple nasal scale measurement uh, and doing a simple nasal surgery. Here's another very simple paper that's come out of the same uh, group, uh, the Stanford group, which is published in JAMA Otolaryngology. And they also said that soft tissue surgery for OSA was associated with lower rates of development of cardiovascular, neurological, and endocrine systemic complications compared with CPAP. This was a huge landmark publication. And if you really look at the chart that's here that's published in the results there, you can see that PAP alone, the number of events were much higher as opposed to CPAP with soft tissue and CPAP with skeletal surgery alone. And if you add CPAP plus skeletal plus soft tissue surgery, everything just went down significantly. The idea of this particular paper and which is a paradigm shift nowadays uh, in us taking care of these patients with obstructive sleep apnea is it is not about using CPAP for all or doing surgery for all or giving mandibular advancing devices for all. It's about customizing the treatment to the patient's needs. So in order to improve the outcomes of PAP therapy, one needs to do a thorough endoscopic evaluation of the nasal cavity and the oropharynx just to improve the uh, PAP compliance. But having said that, sometimes, like I said before, patients are not willing to undergo this particular therapy with PAP or are not, I mean, people have all kinds of uh, uh, problems in terms of they're not able to have uh, uh, wear a mask because of claustrophobia or any kind of uh, a kind of a phobia or anxiety or whatever it might be. Now, how, what are the strategies that are available nowadays to improve the outcome of multi-level surgery if the patient fails CPAP therapy? Now, the most important point here is evaluation. Now, how do you evaluate? So there are two points here that we need to understand. Assessment of severity of the disease and assessment of the cause of the disease. Now, assessment of the severity of the disease, as we all know, is through PSG, and there are levels of PSG that are there. But come 2020, all of us were hit by COVID. Sleep laboratories around the world were urged to cancel and defer all kinds of in-laboratory or home studies for the fear of COVID. Once that came in, there is an explosion of devices that came into the market, which are so small and so compact and so petite that one can use these um, uh, on a, on a, in, a, in a very simple way 
not putting all those uh, wires uh, onto uh, and one if one would see a, a level one or a level two polysomnography, you would understand how small and petite this basic this uh, simple test, which is called one sleep test. This device is called the Night Owl, and this is marketed by Resme. What it basically does is uses the same technology that the your uh, uh, NIV monitor uses. And this is called photoplethysmography. So what it does is that it picks up an attenuation in the PPG signal. So what is a PPG signal? Once you're, there is a constriction in the waveform in the peripheral artery, your PPG, which is picked up uh, by this particular night owl, it tells uh, the machine that a patient has had apnea. Now, what has apnea got to do with decrease in uh, signal of the PPG? It is now known that every apnea is associated with a sympathetic overdrive. And we all know that once there is a sympathetic overdrive, there is peripheral vasoconstriction through the alpha adrenergic receptors. And this is what this PPG picks up, this, this night owl picks up and says that it is an apnea. And it has been so accurate and has been uh, uh, and it's so accurate that the FDA has now approved it as a standard of uh, doing uh, sleep studies. Now, what does a sleep study tell you? It not only tells you the severity of the disease or the need for treatment for that particular individual, it also helps you in post-operative planning, whether this particular patient needs to be sent to the ward or he needs to be observed in the HDU. For example, if a patient has a very high apnea hypopnea index of about 80, it is most likely possible that this patient would, be, uh, would like to be observed in the HDU as opposed to just sending the patient to the ward, obviously, because a higher AHI is associated with more CO2 retention in the body. Hence, you would expect more post-operative complications. Now, when you talk about surgical planning, there are three basic prongs that one talks about. Number one is you need to differentiate if your patient is a global patient or a local patient. If your patient is a global patient, you as an otolaryngologist, as a surgeon taking care of uh, uh, localized uh, anatomical structural abnormalities has no business to touch this, basic, this patient. Philosophy number one. Philosophy number two, you need to understand if your patient is a skeletal patient or a soft tissue patient. That means, is your patient suffering from skeletal overloading causing obstructive sleep apnea or is the patient basically having anatomical fixed structural abnormalities like retrusive maxillas and mandibles causing obstructions into the airway? Because you can't have a patient having skeletal problems do a soft tissue, get a soft tissue procedure just because you know how to do it. And if you do such a thing, you would land up in a disaster. Also, you need to differentiate which are all your, sta uh, your uh, static obstructions and dynamic obstructions because this kind of patients with static obstructions having huge static abnormalities, if you give them a CPAP, obviously the patient is not going to use it. And us as ENT surgeons are uniquely poised to do this basic investigation to find out and customize the treatment to these particular individuals. Here are certain examples of dynamic obstructions and the earlier ones are examples of static obstructions. Now, there is also data now that evaluation in sleep changes the treatment choices in 40 to 75% of patients. And drug-induced sleep endoscopy, which has made huge inroads in the, in the management of obstructive sleep apnea, for those of you who are not sensitized to this term, this basically is using various pharmaceutical agents to achieve sedation and understand the behavior of the upper airway during sleep. Now, these patients 
are not patients who just show up in the outpatient like uh, any uh, laryngoscopy or uh, nasal endoscopy. These patients need to be prepared before they put, uh, the uh, diagnostic, uh, the drug-induced sleep endoscopy. That means these patients should get a PAC before the procedure. This also needs to be done either in an endoscopy suite wherein there is a possibility to administer oxygen, and there is a facility, and there should be a facility to. Uh, measure what the depth of sedation by what is called as a bispectral index score. And of course, to talk about bispectral index score, uh, it, this is not the right platform and all, neither do we have the time to do that, but I'll be happy to talk to you all about this a little later if somebody is uh, uh, you know, interested to know. Now, there are basically three drugs that are used in the, in the drug-induced sleep endoscopy, propofol, midazolam, and dexmeritomidine. Propofol has been the drug of choice for uh, uh, a lot of time, almost for 10 years now, and has been thoroughly tested. Dexmeritomidine is, is, uh, is a darling of the ENT surgeons, and all of us now use dexmeritomidine. But the only problem with dexmeritomidine is that uh, it cannot be used in patients who have cardiac ailments because it causes uh, the, uh, the heart rate to go down. Now, these are, this is a chart to basically show each one of them and how pharmaceutically, uh, pharmacologically they work. And this is a small clip to sort of show you how uh, a drug-induced sleep endoscopy is performed. And I'm sure most of you uh, who have seen any of our uh, lectures from the group must have uh, seen how this looks. What we do is we classify the outcome in the form of a, a classification called the vote classification, wherein we talk about velum obstruction, oropharyngeal obstruction, tongue base obstruction, and epiglottic obstruction. And we score it in this form, whether there is no obstruction or there is partial obstruction or complete obstruction. Now, the problem with vote classification is that it is an oversimplified kind of uh, classification. Hence, there are lots more classifications that have come out nowadays, but we still stick to this because universally, this has got the maximum amount of publications and the maximum amount of uh, acceptance. Now, we have raised the bar a little more because the, our other colleagues have basically said, this is drug-induced sleep. You know, how is it even close to natural sleep? And whatever you guys are doing is bogus. So what we started doing nowadays is what is called as advanced dice, wherein we sedate the patient for sure. But as you're seeing in this particular video, we connect a full-fledged polysomnogram to this basic to this particular patient. And while we are doing the drug-induced sleep endoscopy, the patient also has a a full-fledged level two 21 channel uh, device that is connected to this patient so that we know exactly what we are doing in terms of the depth of sedation, the number of apneas that are happening, and how the airway looks while that particular apnea is happening on the uh, polysomnograph. As you can see, you can see two monitors here. This is the scope that is, uh, this is showing the drug-induced sleep endoscopy in the form of, uh, um, uh, this is the FLP. And here you can see the graph. Let me just fast forward this a little bit. You can see the apnea where there is a paradoxical movement that is happening. And whiteouts that you see here is complete blockages of the airway. And these are the flow limitations that are happening. The same thing exactly happening on the flexible scopy as well. So how does it look when you give the final data? You integrate the polysomnography data with the sleep endoscopy data so that you have an understanding of exactly what is happening physiologically and anatomically in the same 
uh, same side of video. It's easier for us to understand the disease. It's easier for the patient to understand. And uh, just to put the right foot forward, this, this added, uh, is an uh, improvement in our armamentarium uh, uh, in the management. that's out there now that basically tells us that yes drug induced sleep endoscopy is a making a, 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 a change in a treatment outcome as well so there are certain findings that you need to look at when you do your dice which is findings like complete circumferential collapse complete lateral willopharyngeal collapse ap collapse at tongue base and supraglottic collapses now these four are the basic findings that gives you bad results when you do surgery for patients having these kind of findings. So having understanding uh, of this particular finding will help the, uh, you guide the patient whether a surgery will be optimal or less than optimal in terms of outcomes. So an approach, how it's changed nowadays is that once the patient comes in, you take in the history, you do an awake flexible laryngopharyngoscopy, you need to do a dental consult, you do a cone beam CT, you do a polysomnography, you assess static obstructions, do a drug-induced sleep endoscopy, then decide what you need to do for the patient. And that is something that has changed over a period of time in the last few years. Also, earlier, it used to be that if there is a skeletal patient, people were doing soft tissue patient surgeries before. And once there is, uh, once there is uh, 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 a kind of a, a situation where the uh, soft tissue uh, surgery has failed, we were going in for um, skeletal surgeries. But all that has now changed, our understanding of what we now call as narrow maxilla uh, has come in. Now, a word about narrow maxilla. Uh, most, most of us in the subcontinent, especially in the South, we see this kind of a particular um, uh, mouth, as you can see. This is a high arched palate. Now, what happens here is since the palate uh, is, the maxilla is so narrow, there is no space for the tongue to sit in. So the tongue falls backwards. This is one of the commonest causes for retroglossal obstruction. And this is called lack of coupling. Look at this patient having the mouth is open, the tongue is falling back. And this is how it looks. This is a patient who is breathing with his mouth open with less lack of coupling. And you can see how the tongue is falling backwards. And earlier, we used to think that this is a tongue base collapse caused by decreased muscle tone. Yes, this could be one reason, but one other reason is having loss of coupling. If you can see here, the coupling is lost for this particular patient. The tongue is falling back because there is no space in the uh, palate for the tongue to be housed and the tongue basically falls backwards, compressing on the soft palate, causing apneas. So what do we do for such patients? We do what is called as distraction osteogenesis, maxillary expansion, or also called as dome. Uh, what we do here is we do a sagittal split osteotomy, a Lefort one, and, and then we distract it. Exactly like how we do a rap, um, rapid maxillary expansion in kids, we do this kind of a technique, and we do this, to improve the space so that the coupling can be brought back, the tongue can be brought back to where it belongs. And you can see the result just by doing this procedure in AHI of 77 to 13. So decision-making in palatal surgery to improve outcomes, if there is, is based on dice findings. If there is an anteroposterior collapse, you do anterior palatoplasty. And it has been shown that in a, in a study of 17 years of meta-analysis that anterior palatoplasty is associated with the highest 
AHI reduction. Now, if there's a lateral collapse, you do what is called as a expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty. I'm not going to talk about all these techniques, uh, but just to sensitize you to the terms. Also associated with good outcomes with a six month follow up success rate of 89%, which is pretty good. When you have circumferential collapse like this, a more aggressive procedure called uh, Sam Robinson's technique is done, um, also associated with good outcomes. But the new kid on the block is what is called as barbed pharyngoplasty, thanks to the newer techniques uh, in, suture te uh, in, in, in sutures. This is a, a suture that most of our uh, colleagues in, the, in gastroenterology use. There are a huge, there's a plethora of uh, techniques that are available there. This is called uh, barbed pharyngoplasty, and wherein the cutting is almost become zero. And this kind of techniques are now associated with improved outcomes wherein we don't do any kind of cutting to any of the muscles. And um, the, the barb uh, stays inside the oral cavity submucosally uh, for about 180 days, causing scarification. And uh, this is the kind of technique that is available nowadays. Quickly, decision-making in hypopharyngeal surgery basically depends on the phenotype. Uh, whether it is macroglossia, retrognathia, hypotonia, or lingual tonsil. Lingual tonsil, as you all know, is easiest, but sometimes you may have to do massive resections like we have done here. But in such patients, it's always better to do tracheostomy because they can have massive post-op edemas. Um, so it's always better to be safe than to be sorry. So do I do uh, tracheostomies for all kinds of patients with obstructive sleep apnea having tongue-based resections? No. Same thing with epiglottis. Nowadays, um, uh, there are two kinds of epiglottic collapses that we know, anteroposterior collapse and lateral collapse. Both of them need to be uh, addressed differently. Uh, as long as the patient is uh, suprahyoid in, in, in resection, the chances of uh, having uh, any kind of aspiration is almost negligible. Weight is another important outcome that we know. As you can see in this particular paper, just by redu reducing the weight in almost two years, this patient's airway measured in the form of an, uh, in the form of, uh, uh, an MRI increased from 11.6 cubic centimeters to 16.6. So weight reduction is very, very important. So we've basically moved in this particular decade from giving CPAP or doing surgery to everybody to wherein personalization uh, that we need to understand that each person requires different kind of uh, technique and different kind of a treatment paradigm has moved from um, us understanding that OST is uh, an entity wherein it's like removing an appendix or removing a tonsil to understanding that OSA is a journey. And these patients would require some kind of these disease uh, uh, modifying strategies sometime during their life. So weight loss is very important. Evaluate your sleep studies, perform dyes, identify the static obstructions and eliminate them first. Communicate with your patients in detail your plan and would come. Not operate on patients with unrealistic expectations. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, sir. <laughs> So this is uh, one of the best presentation to identify the basics of OSA, I think. For those who are at least beginning with the uh, career in OSA, uh, this is the best presentation I ever had to understand the basics. So sir, one question, uh, will you do dental consultation for all patients with OSA? So we have what is called as a sleep board, like how you guys have a tumor board, we have sleep board. So the patient actually comes and uh, uh, sees us, the pulmonology and the dentist at the same time with a single consultation. So it has been found that 60% of patients, uh, especially in South India, have dental malocclusions. So, um, I mean, even though India is one single country, 
we have so many permutations and combinations, so many um, uh, kind of physical, morphologically different, especially look at, look at uh, Kerala for that, for example. I mean, there are so many kinds of people with, I mean, it's a melting point of uh, G-pool, I would say. I mean, with genes probably coming from the uh, from from uh, West Asia, genes coming from the South, genes coming from the African population. So, especially in the South, we have this plethora of people with all kinds of facial structures and having dental malocclusion. So, dental treatment, dental consult is mandatory. Okay, sir. And what is your experience with CBCT, sir? CBCT is very, very good, man. Basically, because it gives an understanding of the airway per se. See here, as, as, as uh, sleep surgeons, we are more concerned about the airway than about the cells in the frontal sinus. So for us, CBCT with, gives a very good understanding of the airway uh, as opposed to the traditional uh, CT. And the good thing is you can achieve it uh, with very less radiation and very short period of time. And CBCT is very uh, easily accessible for a uh, lot of uh, people. So, you know, it is the way to go forward. We get CBCT done for most all our patients. Any, any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinivas. That was a wonderful lecture. Actually, we are short of time and uh, we have already overshoot it. No, thank no, you so much. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. I mean, that to have the last lecture and sit in as chairpersons, I completely understand. No, no. Hats off to you. Thanks. <laughs> thanks to you and our best wishes to Dr. Vidya Sagar. We, dear, we missed him. Do convey our regards. Yes, and I we will. We hope he gets well soon. Thank you so much. And that was a good overview and understanding of OSA in a nutshell. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you very much, sir. I Thank request you. Dr. Roshan to present the memento to the chairpersons. On behalf of uh, our remaining committee, Srinivas, very thank you. For, thank you, for... Dr. Sajid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Now we'll disperse for a tea break, after which we have the sports. The table tennis would be conducted near the reception. And we request everyone to gather in this very hall for the banquet at 7 p.m. In the number of Natalie Everkum, Ash.